Hi, welcome to the September 1st, 2020 Club Cubase Google Hangout. I'm going to do a quick audio test. Bear with me just a minute. Okay, um, we. My name is Greg Undo. I'll be the host for today's hangout. Uh, I'm based in uh, United States, outside of Washington D.C. area in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, if you haven't attended a Club Cubase Google Hangout before, how it works is we'll take live questions from people. We uh, questions can be submitted in advance to Club Cubase at Steinberg.de or you could enter them in the chat field. Um, so we're gonna, if we were watching this live, we're gonna get uh, give a little bit of time for people to get logged in. We may start about 10 minutes after the hour. We may, if you're watching this on a rebroadcast, um, you can probably skip ahead. We'll try to have the index for the topics covered in today's Hangout with timestamps posted later tonight or early tomorrow morning. Uh, and if you wanted to introduce yourself, if you're watching live in the comments field, uh, tell us who you are and where you're from. Uh, we'll let people get logged in. Uh, and you could also ask questions in the chat field. Um, as we work with this, realize that uh, the questions will exceed uh, the pace of my ability to answer them in real time. So... You may ask a question, it may take a little while to get to the answer. We'll try to go through all the questions chronologically. So it won't help you to ask the same question repeatedly. It just kind of slows the whole process down. Um, so if we could try to avoid that. Also, if you have questions that might be uh, to a particular version, it may be helpful to indicate, like I have Cubase Pro 10.5 or I have Cubase Elements 9.5. Uh, that could be helpful as well. So we'll go ahead and take a look at people that are getting logged in. Like many people here, I have my family. Uh, we're like many people currently with the pandemic. My family's at home, so there may be uh, some interruptions. So I'll apologize in, in advance for that. I may have to get a show on for my son. And you may hear my wife, who's working directly above me. Yeah, she's doing her work, so I apologize in advance for any of the interruptions, but let's go ahead and take a look and see who is on the Hangout. Okay, so I see... Let me just switch programs here. All right. Okay, so we have some questions on routing. We have Mark Davenport. Um, so we have David from India. We have Vinny from Orlando. Good to see you, Vinny. All right. So we have London. All right, so we have Ted Springman. I think he's in Sherman Oaks. Robbie Bowling is in Dallas. So Ted wants everyone to do a field trip to London. Sounds good to me. They may not let it, us Americans in, though. Um, okay, so some levels. We have Matt from Fort Wayne. Okay, we have Hans from the Netherlands, close to Amsterdam. We have Taylor from Pine Grove, Pennsylvania. Okay, so we have Agent K. All right, so we have Columbia. We have Sweden. All right, we have John checking in from Kenosha. We're wishing you that everything, that you're being safe, John. And hopefully any of the unrest is not in your particular neighborhood, but you're in our thoughts. All right, so we have Amir from Iran. Good to see you on a hangout again. All right, so we have Omu from Madrid. We have Dennis, or Denny G from New York City. We have Greece, Michael from Weatherford, Texas. Jan in Stockholm. We have Finland. We have Matt from Central California. All right, so we have Slovak Republic. 
All right, so we have Sol Korea. It's 2 a.m. Thanks for staying up very late or very early. All right, so we have the Virgin Islands. All right, so we have Portsmouth, Virginia, fellow Virginian. That's great. Okay, so just seeing a question on some plugins missing. All right, so getting more people logged in. And we have Agent K will be doing some moderation for us. So I think we appreciate Agent K for that. Okay, so I see Dennis wants me to get going already. He's in the hospital waiting to get a stint done. He wants to see, he wants to see the broadcast. So we'll wait just for a couple more people to get logged in. If you could just be, a, yeah, good luck with your procedure. All right. Okay. See some questions on plugins. We'll wait just a couple more minutes and get started. All right, There's some more people getting logged in. All right, so we have Greencastle, Pennsylvania. We have Jazz Dude from Germany. All right, so we have Gareth checking in from Basque. All right, so Millard Brown from Pennsylvania. And Dennis, you could uh, watch the Hangout after in recovery if if we, you know, if you're getting going through your procedure. So good luck with that. Okay, so see question of audio pitch correction. Yeah, I see a comment, there's a high-pitched whine in my audio, so I may have to go through and just check. Uh, it could be just, I'm hearing a little bit as well, but it might be just a, like a ground problem. I'll try to investigate over the next couple of days. Sorry about that. Okay, maybe one more minute and we'll get started. Get enough people logged in. Okay, so just seeing some questions on Hallian. A 
Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so we have a question. Can you please explain what is the difference between routing and direct routing? Many thanks. So if we have routing in our mix console, so I will come over here and let's open up the routing tab. Uh, I will just hide some of my input channels. I don't need to see those at this point. So we could see that we'll have our routing set up here. So this is our input and output destination. So we could send this to physical outputs on our audio interface, or you could send it to different groups uh, if we wanted to, but we have kind of a single destination. Now, when we activate from the racks direct routing, this is gonna allow us to, uh, to send not only to this destination, but we could also route to a different destination. So let's say if I came here and I wanted to add uh, a couple of group tracks, so I will add two group tracks. We'll make them stereo groups. And what I could do now at this point is I could say, I want these going to my stereo out. And if we wanted to kind of molt or send this to different destinations, I could hold down my alter option plus, I'll select all those channels by holding down shift key, hold down alter option plus shift. And I could say, let's send all these to group one, and let's send them all to group two as well. Now, when we do this, we could say we want to activate a little icon here called uh, direct routing summing mode. So if I wanted to at this point, we'll have our Q link. So hold down alter option plus shift. And I could now send the drums to multiple destinations. So that's what the direct routing will allow you to do. Now, as we do this, one of the other unique things is I could say I wanted all these drums going to direct routing only in a particular part of the song. So you could automate direct routing changes. So let's say if I wanted to uh, automate all these different parameters and say, when we get back to this part of the song, I could just turn off the, the, the routing. And when we come here, I want to send it to like this group. And let's say I have this group set up as a parallel where I wanted to maybe compress this heavily. So at different parts of the song, I could now just say, and I could turn this on and off. So now if I wanted it to come here to my transport, I could just rewind a little bit here. And, and when we do this, the automation for the uh, routing can be done with direct routing. So you can't really automate routing with uh, the normal routing, but direct routing can be automated. So that's another difference with that. So direct routing allows you to automate the routing changes as well as be able to, um, you know, send to multiple destinations as opposed to uh, the normal routing can be done just for a single, you know, just sending it somewhere, but without the capability of automation. Okay, uh, question, can you demonstrate the use of the four articulation columns and expression maps and groups? Uh, never got my head around these parts of expression maps. So generally this isn't used too much, uh, but depending upon the instrument itself. So let's say if I wanted to uh, load up a project that has some of the different expression maps as we wanted to uh, come directly to our expression maps set up, here so it could be where you know the intention is where you may have uh like short notes and then you get to have um you know different you know different uh articulations to kind of further supplement i haven't seen many expression maps that actually take advantage of that so most of it 
will just kind of indicate the articulation one. But if you had, you know, different spiccato, you know, uh, you know, articulations that you wanted to define within spiccato, and then maybe you wanted, you know, this to be, or you want a pizzicato and you wanted a pits to be a collegno buttato, you could have those additional distinctions, but it's not, it's not commonly used for that. So, but the ability is there. Okay. So let's see. Uh, hi, Greg from India, David from India. Uh, my audio gets automatically adjusted to tempo, how to avoid it. So when you import an audio file into the project, so I will just kind of start with a particular project here. And sometimes when audio is dragged in and if the audio has a, uh, a tempo stamp in the audio file itself and we drag it in, we could just come directly here and say, okay, I want it to go to my loops. Uh, and as we have different loops, um, so if I just wanted to drag this in, we'll create just a, a loop here in this particular file, all you'd have to do for it not to respond to tempo changes is from the info line, just make sure that you have musical mode turned off. And at that point, uh, if you have musical mode turned off, the audio won't change. So as you drag audio in, or you could just do a select all for all the audio files and just make sure that musical mode is turned off for them and then they will play back at their original file. Okay, so we have Vinny uh, saying hello from sunny Orlando, Florida. Good to see you on a hangout. All right, um, so a question from Ted. Good to see you on a hangout. Do you have workflow tips uh, for live instrument cycle recording to uh, a guide track split into many sections and toggling between the markers uh, with a Bluetooth keyboard all without leaving the ISO booth. So if you want it to uh, use a particular, uh, you know, Bluetooth keyboard, and this works well for a lot of different sources where people may want to have a uh, a you know instead of having a remote control setup just taking kind of a bluetooth keyboard um, and if you're doing a lot of different functions what i would do is to set up um, a marker track so let's say if i'm here and i will set up a marker track up top so i will just come right over here let's add a marker track and I would set up like the different sections of my piece where I would say, okay, from here to here, I want to add cycle marker and I wanted to add, this is the next part of the piece I'm working on and I'm going to be in a remote booth, uh, maybe playing drums or doing voiceover. So I would define all of my markers like so. So I just grab my range selection tool and then I'm just clicking on add cycle marker and you could do this however you want. So, and then the track that I'm recording on, uh, what I would do, whether it's an audio or MIDI is I would just come right here and know that if you hit the, you know, and as I wanted to just take uh, let's say if I'm in object selection mode, know that I could hit the arrow up key and down key here to just navigate. So at this point, if I wanted to record on this particular track, hit the arrow up key, and now you could just navigate. <coughs> Excuse me, let me... All right, sorry about that. But you could just hit, uh, you know, N and then go down to the track that you're gonna record. So let's say, okay, now I'm gonna record on this track, hit the arrow up key and, you know, you could just hit N 
and you could navigate to your markers like so. So I need to, re you know, go to the marker and hit, you know, arrow down at that point, record, hit arrow up. And then at this point, you could just navigate to next marker or using the arrow keys just to do that. So once you have the kind of the marker set up, you know, you could just use the arrow keys to go kind of, you know, to navigate to the beginning of the next marker and use the, you know, up and down arrow keys just to, um, you know, record and able on that particular track. So whether you're doing MIDI or audio, so I would just kind of set it up so you could just use the arrow keys and you could find a groove of it and be able to get your tracks laid down without visually seeing it once you have the markers defined. Okay, so question, how can I get my mod wheel to trigger a to trigger vibrato on a VST instrument? So it really depends on what the instrument is capable of doing. So if I have like just, um, you know, like a lot of patches for organs, as soon as you play and you move the mod wheel, like you'll have kind of like a Leslie effect or you could have kind of like a, a bit of modulation. So I move the, the, my modulation wheel, move the mod wheel. And that particular is sound there will change uh, based on the modulation wheel. So it really depends on what what is set to you know respond to modulation within the instrument. So not every sound is going to automatically behave that way. So you may have to uh, go into the particular instrument and say you know as soon as I have my modulation will do this and the modulation depending on the instrument could be defaultly set to do different types of programming so let's say if i wanted to go to maybe like a synthesizer so let's say like maybe a synth comp sound um so as soon as i come here so as soon as i move my mod wheel now you may be able to bring out different voices. I'll try a different patch. Of course, I, every patch I select won't do anything with the mod wheel. So as we adjust the modulation, So it's really kind of determined uh, upon what the modulation wheel itself is set up to do within the particular instrument. So it's not just where you can do it to every single instrument. And if you have a sample, you may have to, you know, draw in, you know, or have it do uh, like an LFO on pitch to kind of simulate vibrato. So um but it's not where you can just say turn vibrato on, but a lot of instruments will default to that. Okay. Okay, you've gone through some different introductions here. Um, All right, so let me just take uh, going through some. Uh, so we see question. Hello, Greg. Uh, what do I click in preferences so MIDI editor pops up in full screen and not the bottom region? So all you have to do is so if we double click by default, most of these editors will end up in the lower zone. So, but if I didn't want that behavior and I wanted it to like in previous generations of Cubase where it's a floating window, we would go to your preferences, uh, to editors. And here we can say double click opens editor in a window. So now when I double click on a part, it's going to open it in a full screen window. So if I go to my sample editor, it's a separate window. So double click here, it's a separate window. So once again, we would go to your Cubase preferences and under editors, and we'll see double click opens either in the lower zone or in the window.
So, okay, so we see, um, hi, can you question? Hi, can you please tell me how to make my mix console? It says my console, but I'm assuming mix console colorful in Cubase 10. This is one of the things that was uh, introduced in Cubase 10.5, where if you see my mix console with the colors introduced here, uh, this was new in 10.5, so it didn't come in version 10, but uh, the preference, if you wanted to activate it, was if we go to uh, preferences and you go to track and mix console channels, you'll see mix console uh, channel colors for that preference. And now this is how it looked in version 10, where we don't really have the colors from the tracks uh, within the mix console. And now with this preference activated at that point, I could hit apply. And now we can see that that will carry over. And it could be even more apparent when using this particular preference in the full mix console. So if I just wanted to uh, let's say, okay, I want to see my inserts and routing and let's say sends, um, that, so if I activate this preference again, I'll move this over here. So we can see all the colors kind of throughout the mix console. Uh, and this is how it was in version 10. So, and with that particular preference, uh, added in version 10.5, it will then uh, carry over kind of throughout the entire mix console. So if that's what you're looking to do, you may want to upgrade to 10.5. So. Okay, uh, hi there. I have uh, Cubase Artist 10.5 and plugins like Hybrid 3 and Sonavox Wobble just disappeared and there is no way to get them back. What could it be? So if you... Um, just just reread the question. Uh, so it could be sometimes these plugins will get blacklisted. So if you come to your studio menu and go to VST Plugin Manager, uh, it's not blacklisted, I mean, they changed terminology to block list, sorry. Uh, so you may notice that these plugins will be in a block list. And the reason that a plugin gets in a block list is because it's kind of deemed uh, to be to cause system instabilities within your Cubase. So it'll do an analysis of the plugins and deem which ones can be causing system instabilities. So it could be that those plugins uh, were causing system instability. So if there's a VST3 version, that will often be a better choice than a VST2. But you know, check to see if it ended up in the block list of plugins. Uh, and then you could unblock it, but you know, realize that it's been blocked for a particular reason. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think the gain level on vocals always is low when recording. I must set the gain on, uh, on a, uh, Okay, so I guess maybe AI or maybe ASIO, so there's no clipping. Is it supposed to be low and then corrected inside of Cubase? Um, so it could depend upon, you know, check when you're setting the gain level for vocals. You know, one of the things you could do in the mix console here is, you know, as soon as you have your input channels, make sure that A, that you see the signal coming in here. So it should be, you know, you should be able to record kind of your gain structure as expected. Uh, some people will, you know, compensate and drive the mic preamp and, you know, clip the converter. Um, you, you know, I see that a lot. It's just kind of, a, you know, maybe, you know, bad gain staging. Um, but, you know, depending on your audio interface and if you're going into a mic pre into the converter, you could also, you know, I've seen some people using external mic pre's uh, and then, you know, they connect it into a minus 10 input when, you know, it's a, you know, the signal's looking for a plus four output and that could it, attenuate the gain on it so but if it's a, an integrated mic preamp in your console you should be able to see kind of the gain structure here 
And as you record, you could attenuate or add more gain on the input channel. So you'll see your signal coming on the input channels. And here you could add or, you know, take away gain if needed to. But you should be able to, you know, there's nothing really special that you'd have to correct afterwards in Cubase. But, you know, it could be... Um, so it doesn't, you don't indicate if there's, and maybe if you, uh, it's still early in the hangout, if you could indicate if it's, you know, an external mic pre going into a converter. I've seen some people plug uh, an external mic pre into another mic pre, and that, you know, could cause all sorts of gain structure anomalies as well. So, so but there's nothing, no real special tricks in Cubase for that. And I think it's going to be kind of a hardware uh, gain structure. All right, so we have Jay from Connecticut, I believe he's in New Haven. So uh, two questions. How do VST plugins affect CPU and RAM? How is usage scaling? Um, so, you know, VST plugins will, you know, affect your computer's processor. And depending on the plugin itself, most plugins will be more processor uh, intensive. Sometimes um, some can take uh, if it's a convolution reverb that may be able that may be accessing your computer's hard disk as well. You know, if you're using VST instruments, you know, if you're doing a sample based instrument that's playing lots of different samples and sample layers, you may run into scenarios where that's going to be taking more of your computer's hard disk and memory. And if it's a synthesizer, and this is very general, which generating all the sounds that that could take more CPU versus memory, and your computer's you know your computer's hard disk speed. So depending upon the plugin itself, but generally like for like processing plugins like reverbs and compressors, EQs, those will take uh, CPU. Um, and when you mentioned scaling, so each plugin, you know, is not going to be, a, you know, if you're running a single instance of a plugin uh, and how all DAWs will work is that single instance will run on one core. So if you run, you know, eight reverbs, you know, those reverbs can be spread across eight separate processing cores. But if you run, you know, you know, one reverb, you know, that's going to be taking one set of instructions. So just because if you have a, you know, you're like, oh, I have a 12 core processor, I could run this monster synthesizer, you know, running one instance that may only utilize one core if it's only kind of uh, set up as a single instrument. So, um, so question, do I ever use WaveLab for sound design? If so, what are some of your most common uh, go-tos? So if I do sound design in WaveLab, I may, uh, you know, get into more of the spectral capabilities. So which will allow you to, and you can kind of do this with some spectral layers, uh, elements is you know, spectral layers as well inside of Cubase. But if, um, you know, let's say if I just wanted to come here and, you know, as we're doing editing, you know, for sound design stuff, I may get more into, you know, different spectral capabilities uh, a as you kind of work with this. So if you wanted to, you know, edit particular frequencies out or run particular frequencies, like in earlier versions, you could actually select frequency ranges um, and just run those particular frequency ranges through plugins. So that's the kind of thing. And, you know, here when you do this, we see that we have, you know, our low frequencies um, as well as, you know, our, you know, mid-range, our highs. And, you know, we can see when we see these kind of patterns of frequencies, we can see kind of the harmonic overtone series. So as we go to look at it, you know, at this point, you could just, you know, take out particular frequencies. So that's when I would do some like sound design stuff uh, in WaveLab uh, is kind of doing more spectral stuff. But you could also check out, you know, the spectral layer seven, which is pretty amazing uh, that comes, you know, that could be run in conjunction with WaveLab and Cubase. So. All 
All right. Uh, so I just see a comment from Cap 10 Energy. Um, so, hey, Greg, how are you doing? Did you get a chance to check out my videos? So I, I don't think if I got a chance to, um, you know, I remember them from the last uh, or a couple of hangouts ago that you mentioned the videos. But if you want to email me a link again to, I'll see if I can remember to do it. I think I may have looked at some of them. They looked really cool. Uh, but if you want to, um, I remember taking a quick look, but if you want to send me a link, uh, I could just try the cap tenor, you know, your username, uh, but I'll try to do it uh, after the hangout tonight before I start my, uh, start doing the index of topics. But good to see you on a hangout again. And so we have Gareth from the Basque country. All right. All right, so I uh, have always a pling sound by switching tracks. How can I turn that off? Uh, so let's say, you know, as I'm playing here, if I just wanted to switch between different tracks, I don't really have any. I'll try just on another project here. And we'll see if this, I'll activate this project. And as I switch between tracks, um, so I don't have any weird sounds. And let's say if I open up between my track editors here. So let's say I jump to my group track. Let's get to the sources. And if I just wanted to go to my next channels here. So it seems all pretty. And here you can hear the automation. So I'm not hearing any kind of pling sound, but if I'm doing something wrong, just uh, let me know. Uh, so question, can you teach very audio pitch correction? So let's take a look at it. Okay, so when we want to do pitch correction by very audio, what we could do is just kind of double click on an audio part and I'll just take it into kind of our full view. And I will select very audio from the inspector and then I'm going to have very audio kind of do its analysis by clicking on this button. So when we look at our, uh, now what it's going to do is basically take different sections and it's going to just kind of go through. So we could see kind of our uh, melody here. We'll just kind of zoom in. So this is what our vocal looks like. And we can see our piano keyboard indicated here. We see our pitch going up. And there's kind of two different levels of control. So you could say show default smart controls. Uh, I like to show all controls and leave that as kind of my default. Uh, and we'll show you kind of what the controls will do. So we could call each of these segments. And if I wanted to just go to the bottom here, we could quantize the pitch. So I could move that pitch just kind of like just like so and that will allow you to quantize it to the nearest pitch. And there's three different modes for this. Previous versions of uh, would actually allow you to do relative. So as we moved the pitch here, it would snap it. Um, you know, we have kind of different snap values. So let's say this note is a bit sharp. And now if I just wanted to snap it to pitch, it would still move it, but the same amount sharp uh, by different notes. I could also just put it into absolute. So as I just kind of grab notes, it'll just kind of snap directly to the correct 
pitch like so. So you could find its kind of pitch center. As we also wanted to come here, so the bottom would allow us to adjust uh, like how in tune that is. And I could do this for multiply selected notes. So if I want to take a whole phrase and just kind of do my pitch quantize, we could do that. So let's listen to it now. now you're asking Beatles a song. Uh, and we could also, if I was going for kind of a very process sound, I could just kind of, if, you know, looking for kind of the classic vocal process sound, we could adjust the vibrato or kind of the straightened pitch. So now if I wanted it to be very processed. Now you're asking Beatles a song. And you could always undo uh, these changes. So, now you're at so we could do that. Now when we go to the corners of these different phrases, uh, we have some other options. So if I go to the lower corner, I could adjust just the volume. So I could just say. You're asking Beatles a song. So if I wanted these notes to be like, while I'm doing pitch shifting, I want this to be a little louder, a little softer. We could adjust the volume right there. I could also adjust in the lower left-hand corner, the formants. So if I just say, okay, I just wanted to adjust the formant of that particular note. So if you wanted to have kind of more, you know, uh, creative control over formants or as you change. Now, if we wanted to control some, you know, to join pitches together, like when we look at this particular note here, it's probably intended to be one single note. So I could just go to the edge here and that will join these particular segments together. And as we do this, we could, you know, a lot of times you may see singers that drift flat at the end of phrases. We could tilt uh, those particular phrases. And if I wanted to, uh, we see kind of these little triangles here. And what this could allow us to do is as we want to straighten the pitch, we could choose ranges at the beginning and at the end of notes where the pitch isn't really to kind of help with the transitions, but maybe we want it in the middle, the pitch to be dead on. We could also choose this little diamond at the very top. Um, and as we move this, I could just say, we want to adjust the pitch just from this particular point without affecting. Uh, and as I drag my pitch shift over here, we could just say, I want to uh, and as I go to the upper left, right, left hand corner, I could adjust just kind of the pitch there. So it's not scooping and going in. Um, and you could also just say, I want this note only to last this long, or I want it to be stretched out because the singer ran out of breath. Um, so those are a couple of things that you could do within the very audio, but it's incredibly powerful. And I think that the workflow, uh, since version 10, when he introduced very audio three makes a lot of sense. Um, and I thought Steinberg did a great job with that. Okay. Okay, so just see a question. I can't find an answer to this anywhere. Is there a way to keep hit points when bouncing a track or to export MIDI from all the hit points in the sliced up track without bouncing? So when you bounce the track, the hit points aren't gonna be uh, carried over. But if we have hit points, uh, what you could do is let's say, uh, let's say if I go to hit points, let's say on this uh, guitar part here, uh, I will go to my hit point detection. And if I wanted to incorporate those, uh, we could just choose create MIDI notes and we could retain the dynamics or not. And what that's going to do is to automatically, you know, just, so we'll just choose to create MIDI notes and I'll just do on a new MIDI track. Uh, I could do on the first selected one. And that's going to carry over the hit points uh, as MIDI information directly from the hit points from the audio file itself. So 
that's how you could export the MIDI from the hit points in the sliced up track. So. And it's really good for editing drums. Um, so we'll show you what you could do uh, with that if you're doing hit points like that for drums. So I'll revert this quickly. So let's say if I wanted to do just like a quick drum replacement. So let's say like maybe the, the kick wasn't blowing me away in the recording, but I like the feel of it and I have to mix it. So I will just kind of. So as I work with this, what I could do is just double click here. Uh, and I'm going to have just, um, I have a drum set loaded up here with Groove Agent. So let's say I have some samples. I could take my kick. So, and I'm just gonna find kind of the hit points and set the threshold kind of accordingly. So as I do this, and I'll say create MIDI notes and I'll retain the dynamic velocities and I'll just put it on to the first selected MIDI track where I have Groove Agent. And now I'm just triggering the kicks. So I'll mute my kick drums. and I could just layer those together. And if we just kind of turned off Groove Agent. So that's really helpful doing kind of the uh, create MIDI. So once again, in the sample editor, uh, just double click and go to your hit points and just say create MIDI notes. So yeah, it's super helpful for drums. Okay. Okay, so I see a question. How can I switch the mixer name to display two lines? Thanks in advance. I think that this is kind of fixed. Um, so if I come here and I name my tracks, uh, and this could be uh, different in Mac and PC. So let's say if I adjust uh, my track names here, <clears throat> we could see that this will go <coughs> and be able to uh, adjust uh, within the mix console. The names will go to two lines, and I think, um, Someone had emailed me and told me that maybe on the Windows version in 10.5.2 that that went back to a single line, but I could check uh, just to make sure to see. But there's no real setting with that, but it could be kind of based on uh, the version that you're using with that. Okay, so let's um, move on. Okay, so let's, um, all right, my chat field jumped, so let me just get back to where I was. Um, all right, so let's just go ahead. Um, so I see comment or question latency is too small to read in mixer view, how to change the size of that. So when we go to, uh, the mixer view here, uh, and we see the latency settings in kind of the main mixer. So I'll just hide my input channels and I will make sure that we have, uh, the latency view checked here. So we'll make sure that we have uh, the channel latency. 
Um, and as we see this, let's say if I have a couple of plugins, I'll just throw on my master inserts that will have some latency that's easy to, to determine. So let's say I have a, a multiband compressor that often has some latency. So you can see uh, here are the latency settings, but if you actually just kind of click in the field, you could see kind of, you know, uh, the latency set by plugin. So as we kind of uh, did look at it over here, we could actually see what uh, plugins are causing uh, the latency issues and how much latency each of the plugins is causing. So if it's this is too small to see, and it could be, you know, if you're like this resolution is 1920 by 1080, but you know, if you're running like a 4K display, this could be smaller. Uh, but you could just kind of click to the right of that and that will open up in a much bigger window to see the different latency uh, indications. All right, so we see a question. I have Cubase Pro 10.5 with UR44C able to record, but the UR44C is not showing anywhere in Cubase. Uh, are there settings in Cubase I'm missing to have it show? Um, so one is to make sure that you have uh, the drivers set up. Uh, and when you say it's not available to show, I'm not sure exactly what it means. I have a UR24C that I'm using here. So it's a pretty similar interface. So I just went to um, here. I could see my, you know, I go to my studio menu to studio setup and under my VST audio system, uh, I could just see my UR44C you know, laid out for me right here. So make sure that you install the drivers. You know, it's not a class, you know, while it can be a class compliant for, you know, there's a, probably a little switch where it could be class compliant for running with an iPad or iOS. Make sure that switch is not set to class compliant when you have it connected to your computer and that you have the ASIO driver selected. Uh, but if it's recording, it's probably functioning correctly, but you should just make sure that you have the ASIO or core audio driver and that you have that selected here within the within Cubase and you should be all set. But if, um, so, but if I'm misunderstanding, just let me know. Okay, so we have a question in the device manager. Uh, can I have an input coming from one source and the output going to uh, another source such as monitors? Um, so let's say, I will come over here. So let's say our device manager. And let me just make sure I'm in the right area here. So say our MIDI device manager, um, <clears throat> excuse me. All right, so uh, can I have an input coming from one source and the output go to an another source such as monitors? Um, so I'm not sure if this is a device manager. So there's a MIDI device manager inside of Cubase, uh, but you could, you know, if you go to your studio setup for your audio connections, you know, if you're talking about going to monitors, you know, you if you have Cubase Pro, you'd probably want to be able to have uh, the control room set up. So here you could have like currently I have uh, my outputs going to my HS7s, which is the feed that you guys are hearing, but I could have other monitors that are set up and my inputs for my audio interface that are independent of the two. So it, this isn't in the device manager, but in the audio connections, and that's where you could define your inputs and outputs. Uh, and generally, if I, in Cubase Pro, I have the, stereo output defined but not connected and then I run it in the control room and then all of my inputs are kind of available independently. OK, 
Okay, so uh, hi Greg and uh, and all from France. Are the text fonts in Howling in Six uh, Cubase ten point ten point five point two Pro resizable? I want to widen them. How? So if we want to look at Howling in Six here, so I'll just go over to my. So I'll drag in a Halion 6 here. So when we look at this, this sizing, these fonts, uh, I don't know of a way to change their particular size. I'll just take a look, see if there's anything under options. Uh, but I think the font size is going to be consistent. Um, And so I don't know of a way to change the font size uh, within Halion. I think that might be fixed other than having your screen resolution change. Uh, and if it's, you mentioned, you know, and just in case it's for Halion Sonic SE, I think that's going to be kind of the same uh, setting. So it would have to be just a change in resolution of your display driver. Okay, so I see a question from Ted. Uh, how to dissolve a MIDI track into 12 tracks where each one gets a specific note from the 12-tone scale? So, all right, let's take a look, see if we could do that quickly. There might be an easy way to do it, or we could do it, I'm sure, from a logical editor. Okay, so I'll activate this. Okay, so I will. Okay, let me just. I'll just go to this part here. Let me just enter in a quick chromatic scale. I'll just draw some notes in. Sorry about that. Let me just. Right, so So I think if we wanted to come here, we could say MIDI to dissolve part. And then if you wanted to separate pitches. That each of those would automatically be uh, broken down by their pitch like so. So as soon as you have uh, notes 
uh, you know, in a particular area, all you have to do is go to MIDI and dissolve part and choose to separate pitches. And then each pitch would automatically be mapped to its own particular track for you. Okay, so a question. Uh, hi, Greg. Do you know of any crashing problems with, with browsing uh, .mid drum patterns file browser connected to Groove Agent? The kit just sent email to support about persistent crash uh, with dump file. I haven't run into uh, any issues with that, um, but if you have uh, like some different MIDI files, uh, you know, I haven't run into any particular issues with that. Okay, so, um, all right, so I see a question from uh, Keyflow Music. Can we edit file names in Media Bay? So if we wanted to uh, jump to Media Bay here, and we wanted to edit file names, uh, all you'd have to do stop that as you know we'll go to the right zone and I'll just make this full screen okay so let's say if I just want to Right, so let's say if I just wanted to. And see if we could edit name. So you might have to you know because the media bay is going to be referencing the name on the particular file itself so let's say so you may have to just you know you could add kind of Let's see if we could add a, you know, you could add your own name to it, but it looks like the media bay is going to, you know, deal with the particular name of the file, um, you know, instead of renaming it in the Explorer. So it might be that you'd have to, you know, go to the particular um, source of the file and rename it there. Uh, as opposed to having it so that Media Bay still kind of keeps that reference to it. And I'm just seeing if there's, there might be a way of doing it, but I think it's going to just uh, determine the actual name from the location. So you may have to change it at the location and that would automatically reflect in Media Bay. Uh, so I used to see uh, Keyflow, can we drag and drop like Studio One? So yeah, tons of stuff can be dragged and dropped in Cubase. So if you wanted to have, you know, instruments, so let's just come here. So if I have my VST instruments, I want a loop mash, I could just drag that and make uh, that particular instrument. If I have inserts open I could just go to my different effects uh, so if I wanted to drag it to a particular track that would place it as the insert if I wanted to 
uh, drag it below a track that will put it as a re an effects return channel. All of my audio and you know different loops we could just drag and drop right into the project as well. So if you just want to, you know, so anything that you wanted to drag over from Media Bay, you could drag from desktop, but you could also have you know different presets. So I wanted to come over here and have you know channel strip presets. So if I go to uh, my particular, let's say I have some audio files here, um, you know, and I have this channel open, you know, we could just drag and drop presets directly onto tracks as well. So if you want to have effects presets, you know, so very much, uh, drag and drop, you know, samples into groove agent, you know, effects, different presets, file browsers. So a lot of drag and drop that you can do. So. Okay, uh, so I see Dennis commenting. The problem is I'm having is I bought a Spark Amp, which has its own audio interface. When I play back a track, it goes through the Spark Amp instead of the monitors in my studio. So yeah, you probably want to use, you know, a lot of times, you know, it's easy for a lot of things to give you your own audio interface, but, and the problem that you have when setting up, you know, you could on the Mac platform set it up to do, a uh, aggregate device where you could use two different audio interfaces. But the problem is that compounds the latency. And on Windows, some people use different audio interfaces just by using like uh, ASIO for all. Um, but the problem is that the two of them tend to, you know, their clocks, there's no way for the internal audio clocks to resolve. So the two clocks will run out of sync with each other. And that's generally a bad thing to have your audio going out of sync. So instead of using your Spark guitar amp USB output, you know, you may be better just connecting that directly into your audio interface instead of using the USB. If you have a USB interface, you know, if you have an audio interface already, so you're probably not really gaining anything. So if you have the capability you know, try not to do it because you realize that the digital audio clocks are kind of the uh, the DNA of what makes a, a program like Cubase work. And when we have, you know, the different elements are out of sync and Cubase can't control that, it's a bad thing. So try to just go analog out of your Spark. Um, I'm sure there's an analog out. So, and, you know, it could you know if you have a usb if you have an interface already you know try not to use your guitar amp as an interface um All right, so let me say, see, Ace kind of referencing maybe a question he had asked before, but I'm not sure if I saw it from earlier. Uh, so if you get a chance, Ace, to ask a question. Um, so I see question, uh, can you set up two groups of faders so that one set moves in the contrary direction of the other? So it's not really set up in the mix console to, you know, as you set up, you know, you could have these two faders linked together. So if I wanted to come here and let's say link these two, I could just put it into like a quick link and be able to do this. But there isn't a, uh, you know, move it, move this one up and the other one goes down in contrary motion. Uh, you could do, you know, automation and reverse the automation. So I've seen some people do stuff like that, but there isn't a function to uh, just have kind of, you know, a contrary motion, a, like a contrary link between two faders. But I've seen people do it with, you know, just, you know, drawing in automation quickly enough. OK, 
Okay. Okay, so we have Jason checking in from a cloudy South Shields. Hope you're doing well, Jason. Okay. Okay, so uh, so question: When I import a MIDI from Media Bay, it can have a lot of overhead, i.e., instrument attribute, sustain info, maybe more overhead. How do I clean a MIDI? So you know, if you wanted to, um, so let's say if we have uh, MIDI, and I'm unsure if it's a um, if it's a MIDI loop or a MIDI file. So when we have a MIDI loop, for instance. Uh, I think we have some in here. So it'll kind of look like this. And let's just uh, do something besides drum beat here. So let's say maybe like arpeggios. So say I just drag and drop this MIDI loop over, um, and then we'll play this. All right, so a MIDI file, when you drag it in, it isn't really associated with a particular, um, you know, with a particular instrument, but a MIDI loop has the, the instrument and its sound so that it knows exactly what instrument to play back the MIDI information from. Uh, and as you do this, um, you know, let's take a look at this part in like a list editor. And sometimes this may include um, a program change. So if it's a MIDI file, when you drag it over, you would probably see that it would have, uh, you know, MIDI information. It would have like a program change, maybe effects and if you wanted to get rid of that you could go into the logical editor um and there may be even a preset for like get rid of patches um let's just see if there's Um, but you know, what you could do is just go to kind of the logical editor and here you could choose to filter out, um, you know, or you could just say delete and you can say type is equal to, you know, program change. And if there's, uh, and we could also say type is equal to, and you may have like standard MIDI file events. And you could delete those different, you know, sometimes people do lyrics and, you know, a bunch of extra metadata, like, you know, my name is so-and-so, I did this MIDI file. So you could choose to delete out the standard MIDI file events. But if it's a MIDI loop, that's going to, and I'll just make sure. Um, so, you know, that would include the instrument, but if you wanted to get sustain information, you know, just go to the logical editor again. And so let's say I'll just go to the logical editor. And if you have sustain pedal, you just want to say, you know, you want to delete, um, you know, let's say program changes, you want to delete standard MIDI file events. And you could also say uh, controllers, uh, and you can say the controller value one is equal to 64. So that would delete the program changes, sustain, as well as like any metadata for standard MIDI files and just choose to hit delete and then you'd be all set. Okay. Um, OK, 
Okay, so I just see from Ohas. Ohas, uh, I've been trying to edit audio wave outside the track. Um, so I'm, maybe if you could uh, reiterate the question or ask in a different way, um, I could maybe help you out with that. Okay. Okay, we see Dennis is going in for his operation now. We'll see you on the on the outside. So, good luck. Okay, so we see Paul, the guitarist from Lynchburg, Virginia. Okay. Okay, so we have Rudy watching Club Cubase and drinking coffee in Seattle. I miss drinking coffee in Seattle, so I'm jealous. All right. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, hi, Greg. Joe from Austin. Any tips for maintaining proper gain from a recording of a speaker uh, who drifted from the mic? Uh, I hope you are, you are well. Many thanks. Um, yeah, so sometimes if someone, if you have a speaker that is going back and forward and moving back in the mic and maybe they're off to the side and it's not a very consistent volume level. Um, you know, stuff like that. Sometimes, you know, running a compressor can sometimes help. Um, you know, but it's, you know, if, you know, you don't have that information in the recording, it could be very hard. You know, what I've done on a lot of, vocal you know if you do you know i did a lot of um i did kind of editing for a book on tape that was remote recorded and the guy you know who led a fascinating life kind of this real life forced gump-esque character you know meeting multiple presidents and you know world war ii being shot down and you know just a fascinating life story um but you know they would record him and <clears throat> he would get pretty drunk and as he was kind of working on different stuff uh he would you know tend to go a bit uh you know you know moving a lot on the mic and you know it recorded him on the porch and stuff like that so i would do a lot of cleanup on stuff like that and you know what you have what you may have to do and after a while you could see it but let's see i'll just do some quick find a dialogue track here Okay, so let's say if I was just kind of coming over here, and this is where like the clip gain can make a big difference. And I know this is sometimes very tricky to do if you know you don't have as much gain, um, but being able to you know take different phrases here and just hit like Shift X and say I need to bring this up, I need to bring this down. And kind of, if you could level, you know, set your levels kind of here and get that as regulated as possible, um, you know, and I know people that do this for vocals all day, every day, you know, and they'll just cut each word and, you know, just, I want to bring out that plosive, this breath was a little too much right here so just selecting different areas hitting shift plus x and then just you know bringing up different parts and after a while you will you know be able to take out plosives uh and bring parts up where they're maybe back or if they're like eating the mic to be able to bring it down um then once you kind of do that process, then run it through a compressor and that could help regulate it a bit more. But I think between kind of doing the clip gain processing and running it through a compressor, um, you may get lucky and just be able to put a compressor on it and, you know, have it magically work. My guess would be 
uh, that you would probably have tried that already or you wouldn't have asked, um, but try the clip gain in conjunction with a compressor. Uh, and that worked well with, you know, doing my book on tape from a porch from an old drunk guy. Okay. I see a nice comment from Ohas Ohas. Uh, chilling, just watching Greg Guru, his way through the matrix at Cubase. I just push buttons and talk. That's all. Um. So I see Keyflow mentioned, yeah, people want me to start doing Cubase tutorials. So I'm studying his teaching styles. No, I'm flattered. So uh, I see uh, Michael Teens indicating that make sure you smash the like button, beat the rush, do it now. So that's I won't disagree. Thank you, Michael. Um, so I just see comment uh, question. Is there a playlist tutorials for Cubase 10 Pro for a total beginner on Cubase? Um, so you could definitely, you know, there's lots of different playlists available. You know, like I did a tutorial on like your first recording in Cubase. And then, you know, that's been incredibly popular one. Um, I'm not, sh I haven't looked through all the playlists, but there's lots. And I, you know, I think, you know, between the different people that do tutorials for Cubase that, you know, that there's a very active YouTube community. And that's a big part of what Steinberg does in helping out not only in hangouts like this, but other tutorials. So, you know, look on the main Steinberg page, look in youtube.com slash Cubase uh, and check out all those different resources. But there's lots of resources to kind of go through. So, and I see Jazz Dude mentioned that he has some in his uh, Cubase Hangout Discord. So check those out as well. That there's a beginner section. Uh, so I see from Ace. Uh, Hi, Greg. I downloaded one of the Cubase demos to study it, and it has a little padlock icon. How can I disable lock so I can move the track around? So if there's a padlock icon, it's probably, so let's say if I have uh, like this track, um, there's probably just a lock here. So you could say lock position. Uh, and let's say if I make this larger, if, so we see like the little padlock here. So now if I move it, so try to select it and under lock, just set it to none and then you should be able to kind of freely move parts around so sometimes people as they're doing that once they've done a lot of editing on you know they want to make sure that they're not like where they out clever themselves or like oh i just moved that oh and why isn't everything falling apart i spent eight hours editing so people will choose to lock different components whether it's the position the size the position and size you know so other attributes so try selecting it and from the info line click here and then uh, you should be able to turn off the lock And just seeing a nice comment from uh, Jason Sykes says, purchased Italian 6 as a cross grade for 107 pounds. A no brainer, really. And I must say, getting grips with it slowly, but what an amazing tool it is. It is a, you know, probably, you know, I always describe it as my desert island instrument, or if I only had to have one VST that could do everything, it would probably be Italian 6. Um, so glad you're enjoying your purchase. Okay. Okay. So, uh, question: Can you ask Michael to give a heads up on upcoming Spectral Layers Hangouts? I missed the last one. Uh, I will. I know that he was going to be doing it, uh, and then I think had some 
technical issues and canceled it and then kind of rescheduled it uh, shortly thereafter. But uh, I'll see if they could do. But make sure you subscribe. I think that's on the normal Steinberg Software YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe to that and you'll get notified of upcoming Hangouts. Okay. Um, Okay, so I see uh, Greg and everyone. First question: When is anticipated release of Cubase 11 version? So you know, generally Steinberg doesn't uh, announce stuff so far in advance. So you know, uh, when stuff is announced, you know, recently, like over the last five, maybe ten years, you know, the announcement is the same day of release. So we don't get into, uh, you know, the anticipation factor, you know, it used to always be, you know, like a lot of companies would announce stuff in January at the NAM show. And it used to be, you know, the running joke was the acronym of NAM was not available, maybe March. Uh, and then it turned into not available, maybe May. So, you know, I'm sure that the fine ladies and gentlemen that are doing the development um, are working really hard. And, you know, when Cubase 11 is done, you know, they'll release it, so. Okay. Okay, going through. Um, Okay, so I see a question uh, from Gary Ward. Hi, Greg from Florida. Do you recommend storing your final mixes as a stereo mix in a separate folder within the project folder? How are the final mixes usually treated? Uh, versions seem to add confusion. It doesn't really matter where you put the files as long as you know where to find them. And that's the big critical thing, you know, and it's, uh, you know, when I go to different people's houses or I'm on their computers remotely helping them, you know, I often see, you know, uh, you know, you know, stereo mix, final, you know, stereo mix, final two, final, 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 you know, four times, you know, so, but as long as you know, you know, wherever, you, whatever folder you save the files to is fine. You just have to be able to know which one is your, you know, is your finished mix. Um, you know, so as long as you know where to find the files and you have, you know, and every person will have kind of like their file organization. And, you know, sometimes you look at people uh, you know, and you go, wow, you know, your actual desk is probably as messy as your computer desktop. And you're not very good at being able to find that particular file or you can't find this. And, you know, people you work with, you know, who inevitably just can never find the file that you sent them two weeks ago. So as long as you know where your mix down is, I've seen some people stored in a separate mix down folder just in case, you know, someone deletes the file, they'll, they'll back it up to a cloud drive, you know, they'll have it in, you know, named as mix down, stored in a project folder. I know a lot of people will store the mix down in the project itself so that that file is always associated with that project. So when you do the final export audio mix down, that you create uh, an audio track. So when you go to that particular project, you could just have that mix down file within that particular project. I think that's a great idea to do. So when you open up the project, the mix down is there afterwards. If you need to make any tweaks or adjustments, you could do that. But as long as you can find a file, it's you can store it wherever you want. Just you know, Just make sure you have a system down. Uh, so we see a uh, question just out of curiosity, does Steinberg notify the plugin makers that they have issues? You know, when issues come up and it becomes apparent uh, and it's pretty obvious, um, you know, there is a lot of behind the scenes communication that goes on between developers, between the companies, um, you know, and sometimes I don't get to see it. I'm more kind of on product specialist marketing side. Uh, but I've been, you know, fortunate enough to be invited while in Hamburg, you know, to some of the uh, development team meetings, uh, you know, some of the, you know, uh, 
you know, like head of development. One time I was there, he just invited me because he thought it'd be interesting for me to see. And, you know, it's, it's, and one of the things was to me is like how, you know, the different developers between the companies do have a pretty steady stream of communication for issues that will come up. So I'm not sure if, you know, if, uh, like if there's a trigger in it that goes, but you know, a lot of times, you know, there is communication going on between the different companies. Okay, so I see question. Um, uh, I want a darker theme for Cubase. Uh, I hope we get that option in 11. So I think you could probably darken up a lot of the aspects of Cubase already. So a lot of people will say it's too dark, uh, especially like when you know the darker themes kind of started coming out a couple of versions ago. But if you want it to be darker, I think you, if you go to preferences, uh, and you know, there's different color schemes. So we, here we can see our project area background. Um, you could make that darker if you wanted to. So if I just come here and hit okay, you know, you can make different aspects darker, or if you wanted this to be the defaults, um, at that point. So, you know, feel free to kind of go in here and play around, but you know, there's still some, you know, you could turn the lights down even further uh, if you want to. Okay, uh, is there a special command for panning to center or leveling to zero? So when we come here, let's say I have my uh, fader here and I wanted this to go to zero. I think it's just uh, if you click and hold down command or control, that will do that. So if I come here and I have my pan, click uh, command or control while clicking with the mouse, and that will automatically set it to zero dB or to uh, your center in the panner. So if I come here, hold down command, control, and click, and then you'll be centered, click there, uh, and then that will take you to zero dB. Okay, uh, so I see uh, probably a further uh, uh, clarification. Uh, I was asking about the low record level for microphone. I have no preamp for mic, just a Zoom R24 and dynamic mic, always weak record signal, I think, small display in the input channel. So, you know, make sure that, you know, there's probably gain structures that you need to set within the, I think the Zoom R24 is kind of like a mixer uh with an audio interface kind of integrated with it so if that's the case you know make sure that you have um you know let me i'll just take a quick look at it just to make sure You know, so just looking at a, a picture to zoom R24, make sure that you have the gain. You know, there's the knob right above the LED faders. Make sure that you have that gain uh, adjusted up. I know you may have like a four segment meter, which is uh, probably not the most useful metering for input uh, right below that. But, you know, try adjusting the gain up of that. Uh, and that will, you know, if you, if you have that all the way up, then you may just have to, you know, somehow, you know, once it's in Cubase, you know, you could add to the input level in Cubase, but you know, you'd probably want to fix it at the source itself. So make sure that the gain, and that is kind of like, I bet that's probably just looking at the picture of the unit, the 
uh, the mic pre input level. So make sure that's all the way up. And, you know, I, you know, again, I see like a four segment meter, which isn't incredibly, uh, may not be so useful. So look at the meter that's going on on your input channel of Cubase and see if that re is reflected by the gain knob there. And if not, you may have to, you know, consider getting like an inexpensive mic pre, I think ART makes some, you know, um, and that could boost your level as well. But I think you, you should be able to get a decent level out of that. Um, and just make sure that you have that gain uh, right above the, the fader, the top, that you have that cranked up. Okay, so question, can a MIDI track be set up to listen for a single note anywhere up and down a keyboard and only record that one note regardless of octave? So let's see if we can get that looked at here. So I will add in a instrument track. So, or I think we may already have one in here. So let me just... I'll just revert this project here quickly. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. If you've learned a new tip or trick, uh, please feel free to like the Hangout and make sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that. All right, so let's say... All right, so I have an electric piano here. So I'm gonna go to my input transformer and I think we might be able to do it from here. Um, so we can say we want to filter out. And you can say note is equal to um, Okay, so here we could choose to Okay, so we could filter out individual notes here. Um, I know there's a way in a logical editor. Let me just see. I may have to set up in a logical editor first. So I think if we choose to do uh, delete and we can say, value one, And I'm just trying to remember the, maybe it's under context variable. So we'll say note is equal to, I did this on a previous hangout, so I'm gonna have to, Go back and watch my own hangout. But it's one of these uh, where we could actually just assign like all notes or pitches equal to
let me just see if I can remember how to do this. And I think it was like, uh, and Ted, you could probably search your database of hangout topics, but we did cover this. I'm just trying to remember. Let's say type is equal to. Okay, so now if I have, um, okay, so I think, so let's see if I go back to my transformer. So here in a logical editor, we could apply, and we could say note is equal to E. Um, so here we could set it by the pitch. So once it's been recorded, and I can't figure out how to get it on the logical editor, but if I had a bunch of pitches here, so let's say. Okay, so I'll just make this part longer. Sorry about this. So now if I come over here and just say, we're going to delete notes that are equal to the pitch of E. So I'll select all, hit apply. So at that point you could choose to So if I have a bunch of notes that are E, so not on input, but this is what you could do for your logical editor instead of treating on a particular MIDI note. So I have all these E's here. I could just say, we're gonna apply that logical editor and all the E notes go away. So, but it doesn't seem like we, when we do the input transformer, it's gonna look for particular notes, but you could do it after the fact using the logical editor. And again, to accomplish that, you could just say, uh, delete notes where pitch value one is equal to, note is equal to, and this will be the pitch versus the actual note number. So good question, Ted. Uh, hello, Greg. Uh, we have a Wino Ramji or Ramji from Kenya. Why is multi band compressor when added to vocals or bus? There is a delay in vocals or in any audio. Um, so when you add, 
let's say if I add a uh, plug-in, you know, on a, a vocal part or, you know, what it's going to do. And it could determine that, you know, it's going to, you know, if it's going to be added on the track as, after it's been recorded. So if I come here, let's say I have my electric piano part and I play, you can probably hear like my latency, you listen to, you hear my, my finger hitting the keyboard in the mic. But now if I come over here in real time, put on a multi-band compressor, let's say on the on the particular audio track here. So I will go to my inserts and let's add a multi-band compressor. And if this is on during kind of the live tracking, that's gonna impose latency. And that would do it if we were doing live input, but as it plays back, it's not going to, it's gonna compensate for that latency. But that latent, that plugin still takes, you know, 100 milliseconds for it to kick in and do its processing. Now, the multi-band compressor that comes with Cubase has a live mode for a look ahead. So if I activate the live mode, um, that will help with that. So make sure that you have them, you know, so if you're doing it on input, that's gonna impose a latency uh, and you'd want to hit the live mode. But if the track is already recorded and then you put the multi-band compressor on after the recording process, then that will play back in time and the latency will be compensated for. So make sure that you're not trying to do the multi-band compressor on input and if you are, put it into live mode. Okay, so question, how to remove hot mic from recording? Vocal comes out up front compared to VST instruments. When recording vocal mic, you can't use effects due to latency. And I'm trying to uh, get around this. So, you know, depending on your audio interface, so if you have like the Steinberg, like I have my Steinberg UR24C, and that has a built-in compressor on, on the channel. So that's built into the audio interface that's controlled buy software, so, but it has a built-in DSP for that. Um, so you could control that, you know, some of the other plugins, like you just saw how we could do it with the live mode on the multi-band compressor. Um, but, you know, so I would, you know, but a lot of this I think could come down to, you know, the gain structure. So, so just to read the question again, how to remove hot mic from recording, vocal comes out up front compared to VST instruments. Uh, we're recording vocal mic, you can't use effects, you know, just make sure that as you're doing it, you know, so you could have your audio track indicated here. So you could have your input channels uh, and I'll just activate my input channel so you could see it here. So, you know, if you have your input channels, you'll see that. But if you find that, you know, let's say this is the input source that's coming in and then maybe this is the track, you could just bring the level down of this without affecting, you know, bringing this level down doesn't affect the gain structure going into the recording. This will just affect the playback. So you could, you know, leave this gain structure if that's where your mic is connected and just bring this volume down. And that's not going to affect the recording level because that's going to be determined by the input source. So, you know, try just bringing that down as well. And that will probably make it fit better within the context of the particular, you know, project as you're tracking. I would do that. Okay. Okay, and then I see kind of just a follow-up question uh, about recommend for gain staging. You know, so, you know, make sure that, you know, you want to make sure, you know, with gain staging, often you just want to make sure that you're not doing too much gain too early, you know. So make sure you have a good amount of gain coming out of your mic preamp. 
and that the mic preamp is hitting the converter well. So if you try to say, okay, my converter is set too low and you try to compensate by boosting the mic preamp, you know, you just want a healthy gain going out of each stage that's not overdriving or that's not underdriving. And once you have that, you know, the gain structure will kind of fall in place pretty easily. Uh, hi, Greg. Uh, it's a question. Can you please explain how to migrate projects, programs, and VSTs to a new computer? Um, so, you know, when you do projects, you know, the easiest thing to do is if you if you were clever and had a good file organization for your projects, uh, they should all be within one particular folder. So what I like to do when I start a new project is to come over here and prompt for project location. And I put each project into its own unique folder. And that way I could copy that particular folder from, you know, computer A to computers B, C, and D. So, and then all the, you know, once you've defined a folder for a particular project, at that point, um, you just move that folder and everything that's needed for that project will be carried within that folder. So that, so for the projects, that's easy. Now for, uh, programs and VSTs, those could be dependent on, you know, so if once you install Cubase, all the components that come with Cubase are going to be installed with it. So, but if you're using third party plugins, uh, at that point, you may have to just, you know, and it, it could be different for every plugin manufacturer. You may have to reauthorize the license, you know, you may have to, you know, do, you know, you may have to move content over, you may have to sync up a cloud account, you know, with the Steinberg licensing system of being the USB driver, uh, being the USB e-licensor, you know, you could just freely connect that to another computer and you can install all the programs freely and all the Steinberg licenses will be, can be accessed directly from the e-licensor, which is, you know, incredibly handy in these particular, um, you know, situations. Now, as you do this, you may have like key commands and, you know, different user settings that you've created on one computer that you want to migrate to another computer. And this is when you could use your profile manager. So just come over here and export a profile and you could email this profile to yourself. And this would be all of your routing, your, you know, VST plugin presets, your MIDI presets, uh, all of your key commands, your macros, so pretty much all the little things that you would customize and tweak your QBay system for yourself would be stored in a profile. And then once you go to the new computer, just import that profile. But you know, it's the third party plugins is could be the problem or it could be kind of the nuisance in the, in that scenario. Uh, but it's really, you know, if your program, if your projects are all in their own unique folders, you know, then it's just moving that folder over to the new computer via drive or, you know, a cloud drive, something like that. So, okay. Um, so just seeing a comment from Millard says he uses R24 to zoom also. And he says, I try to get three, three green lights on input. Then when bring the tracks into Cubase, I use audio process normalized to bring the tracks up. There's also a slider for wave size. So yeah, so check the gain structure there um on your zoom but you should be able to get a healthy gain structure there i just see a comment ah robot voice on andrea so yeah i'm sorry <laughs> i try not to do it so Okay, um, so I see a question. I have another question. How do we use Quarter? Thanks a lot for helping us, by the way. You're welcome. So Quarter is just a MIDI plugin. And what you could do is, like, let's say if you're not a great keyboard player, you could come over here and just say, okay, I wanted to do 
Uh, and as we play, I could play one MIDI note and it could trigger different chords for you. So, and so we'll go through some of the different presets. So let's say, okay, I wanted to do, um, you know, maybe different jazz chords. So let's say I'll just come here and I'm just hitting one MIDI note. So if I wanted to actually just record that into my session, uh, at this point, I could just click on the record icon for the quarter. And as I just play one single note, I could just... And I would just hit record, that would help. And so now as I... So now, once I recorded the enable, record enabled the plugin itself on the MIDI input, and now when I go to look at it, it's as if I played all those cool chord progressions instead of just using one pinky. So that's kind of gives you an idea how the quarter plugin could work for you. All right, uh, so I see, Greg, how to save the settings for extra controls as default within Vary Audio. So I don't think there's a default way of doing it. Um, so you may have to just activate it, but once you have, you know, I know a lot of people will have templates that they work with. Uh, and then once you do that, you could have the template stored uh, and be able to work with the very audio with the full extensive controls. And I think there might be a keyboard shortcut to kind of toggle back and forth between the two, but I tend to work with all the all controls visible. And I try to argue to get that to be the default and maybe I can express, but I obviously didn't win. So Okay. See, Greg Undo is a religious figure. I always consider myself an Oompa Loompa in a world of Willy Wonkas, but thank you. Um, okay. Okay, and I see a comment from Miller. G's a very audio graduate course here. So yeah, and I there is a uh, tutorial, like I think when Cubase 10 came out, I did a dedicate it, maybe like a 10 minute tutorial just on uh, very audio that will kind of walk through all the features. So you could look for that on the, uh, I think the Cubase 10 launch videos as well. Okay. Um, so I see question, uh, Greg, why is it when I have separate recorded sections on a single track, I can't seem to adjust the volume and so on in a single section, even with range tool. Um, so if we have, uh, let me just try to recreate this. Um, Okay, so let's say if I... Okay, so generally if we... I'll just make these all just a little closer. Okay, so let's say I have these four different audio files. Um, and generally, as you hover over, you could adjust kind of the clip gain of these. Now, depending on the edits that you may have applied, it could be that these have turned into parts. 
So there's parts and events. So if I come over here, I'll say events to part. Uh, so if I now split these, so let's say if I come here and I got rid of some of these different components, All right, so it could be now that when they're set as parts, you don't have the control. And when you double click, you go into a part editor where you could adjust. But if it's like this, I would try to select the events and come over here and choose from the audio menu to dissolve part. And then once you dissolve the part, then you could adjust and have your fade handles. So it could be that the edits that you've done on those particular parts have turned it, uh, are on those events have turned it into an audio part as opposed to an audio event. So at that point, uh, select them and go to audio and choose to dissolve parts. And I think that you'll be able to get kind of all your fade handles and your clip gain handles back. Okay, uh, hi Greg, I think that the audio quality of a wave in a sampler track is worse than used directly in the audio track. What do you think? Uh, I think it sounds the same, but you know, as I take a audio file to the sampler track, you know, it's obviously going to be doing different processing. So if I take this audio file and drop it in, um, you know, if I play it back on... You know, and as you go down, you know, it's doing different pitch shifting and it's doing processing like any sampler does, you know. So, uh, but, you know, just make sure that when you do that, but, you know, when you're, you know, if you want it as an audio track, you could do that, but, you know, you don't have the capability of being able to just simply trigger you know, the sampler track itself and be able to manipulate it in a sample. So, you know, if you go down an octave or up an octave, you know, you will hear a difference in the quality. Um, and that's just because it's processing the audio like that. So, uh, but if you didn't need that, then you don't have to run, you know, I wouldn't find a need to, you know, actually run it in a sampler track. Uh, so I see, hi, Greg, will there ever be a polyphonic very audio? So, you know, I'm sure that it's been in discussion. Um, but you know, we'll have to see a lot of times, you know, I think as you people have worked with the other polyphonic components that they've found it to be not as high a quality as anticipated. Um, so that's something to consider as well. You know, we tend not to be such a me too company, but we wanted to actually, you know, it's like, you know, it doesn't, you know, if something theoretically works and, you know, when you use it, it doesn't work or it's not usable or it's just, you know, the processing quality is really bad. We tend not to employ it for the sake of employing it. So, but, you know, th those algorithms are only going to get better with time. So I'm sure that, you know, thought has crossed people's mind. Okay. Good to see you in a hangout, Gil. Um, hi, Greg. Hi, Baseheads. Is there a way to change the tempo by one increment up and down mapping to a button on my controller? Uh, example, 120, 121, 122. So I th think I understand the question. Let's go ahead and see if we could do it uh, in the controller. So... So I'll just take a, a project here and see if we get, we may have to have a tempo track active, but let's see if we could do that. Um, I'll jump to this project here. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. Uh, if you haven't uh, subscribed to the channel, make sure you do that. If you've learned something new or uh, have liked what you've seen so far, make sure you hit the like button on the 
video, so it's always helpful for us. All right, so let's come over here, revert this. So let's say I have my tempo track on for 100 beats a minute. So I know there's like a shift T, I think, where you could enter in tempo. And let's say, all right, so let's say if I could just take the tempo track from maybe the project logical editor. All right, let me just see if I could. All right, let me look at my tempo track here. Let me look under key commands as well. I may give me. So I know we could do different. Yeah, I don't know way. I know you could do the set tempo and let me just, so if you come here to And I might be able to do it with a macro, um, but let me just see if I could find this quickly. You just keep looking for this. Uh...
All right, so I know if you just do the shift T that you could enter in and But I don't know a way to just kind of increment. So if we're here, I mean, we could not using the keyboard controller, but you could just, you know, using your tempo, using your scroll wheel here. And I know some controllers will allow you to kind of mimic mouse controllers, but you could do that. But I don't know a way in the could try I'll look one other area but I, I could see if I can make a macro that could be triggered from um, but let me look one other area maybe under generic remote So you could enter in the tempo there, but you know, just using the mouse scroll wheel to be able to act to increment and decrement. That's the way I don't know with a uh, with the MIDI controller, but I'll I'll play around with it some more. If you want to email me at clubcubase at steinberg.de. But thanks for the question, sub four oh three. Hope you're doing well. Okay, uh, so we have a question from Ted. Can you show how to use uh, sidechain to gate close or gate open, basically mute or unmute another audio track? Okay, so I think I have a project that's set up for this already. All right, so let's see. All right, so I have two different loops here, and I have just a pad shop sound. Uh, so I have just these pads that are being triggered from uh, the pad shop. So I will come here and let's look at... Um, I have like this pad that is going uh, directly. So I have this pad sound and pad shop. So what I want to do is just to activate a side chain or a gate on this particular synth pad sound and I'm gonna activate the side chain. Uh, and now what I want to do is I could go to my kick drum and what we want to do is to send this kick drum out to the side chain of the gate here. Uh, and I will just take this. So now we'll have the kick. Doing the side chain input. So we'll just have and now I could have more of that gate. And if I turn that off, let's say I want it to have this function as the gate. So this drum loop. And you could automate kind of the differences between these two. So 
so I have this automated to gate between the kick and the drum loop. But if I come here to the synth pad track and just turn off the sidechain input, So you can get like, you know, really, if you want stuff to be very tight rhythmically to other parts without having to play it as tight, if someone's not quite, you know, in the pocket, you could just take an existing part that was a pad and then turn that and do the noise gate uh, and activate the side chain there and feed it from multiple destinations. And you come up with some really interesting effects like that. Okay, so question, uh, can you compose MIDI tracks similar to Dorco where you select note length, play the keys, and will automatically move to the next empty space in the score sheet? Certainly. So let's go ahead and take a look how we could accomplish that. All right, so I'll just find, let's, I'll just put in a quick. So I'm gonna create just a blank uh, part, like so. I'll come here, let's go to my notation view. Uh, I will put this into page view. All right, and I will, Come here, let's zoom in. I'm gonna activate just this little icon here. That's our step input. I will set it to quarter notes. And as I play in, I'll play a chord. Yeah, let's say. So, and that's really, all you have to do is just kind of, you know, enable kind of like your step input. And then if you just hit the, if you want to put a rest in, just hit the right arrow. And say if you hit two notes at once, hit the left arrow. And now I want to put in 16th or eighth notes. I could select based on your quantized value. So now I will just put in And that's kind of really all you have to do. And if you don't make any playing errors, then I could say, let's put in half notes. And 16th notes, or let's put in, you know, quarter eighth note triplets. followed by a half note, and you could have keyboard shortcuts for all of these, and just be able to enter in your notes just like that. So very similar to what you do in Dorco, you could do, just make sure that you have this little, you'll see this looks like a staircase for step input. So the steps that you see, activate that, and that's all you have to do, and it'll automatically advance to the next rhythmic value. Okay, uh, so just reading a comment from Werner. Really appreciate oh, my Hangout chat jumped on me. So let me just jump back. Sorry, my chat field. Okay, so we're back to where it was. So from Werner, really appreciate these Hangouts. Been using Cubase since 1988, uh, yet I'm still picking up new tricks and tips here. Thank you. Uh, still my go-to production software, Sydney guy living in Sacramento. 
thanks for the kind words. So uh, glad you've been running Cubase for all that time. So uh, it's that's wonderful, and glad you still. I yeah, I think I learned new tips and tricks on every hangout as well. So it's uh, great. So okay, so we see Polly D's on a hangout. Um, okay. Okay, so we just had a question, uh, a follow-up on the exporting hit points. If I have a heavily cut up edited drum track, it's really hard to export MIDI from every single slice. Uh, if I bounce, I have to set up hit points again. Is there a shortcut? Um, and it's further continued on. Uh, I spend so much time setting hit points for some auto-quantizing and then have to do it all over again after the bounce, uh, the final edit before I export uh, MIDI for samples. You know, I, I've i done a lot of, you know, pretty extensive drum editing like this. So, you know, I haven't really found, you know, the exporting, you know, generating the MIDI, uh, you know, is pretty automated to me. So let's just take a look at it. Again, um, so jump back here. So let's say if I want to go, you know, directly to this event, um, you know, the hit points, you know, to, to, so let's say I go to my snare and I just wanted to zoom in. Uh, I will set my threshold up because I'm seeing a lot of, uh, you know, different parts, like the hi-hats, toms. And then just to be able to create MIDI slices, uh, it seem, that doesn't seem so arduous to me, um, but you know, maybe if you have, you know, a hundred different tracks of drums I could see, but you know, it's not like you're doing the hit points manually. Um, so, you know, I found, you know, just, you know, and after a while you get a sense of what the threshold is going to be on, uh, you know, different parts. Uh, you get to see the patterns of tracks that are bleeding through. Like here we have the hi hats and maybe some of the kicks bleeding through. Uh, but you could just kind of set the amplitude uh, accordingly and then just do the one create uh, MIDI notes and then, um, you know, it seems pretty straightforward to me. But uh, if you have like a really horrible example you'd like to share with me, you know, you could email me a download link at clubcubase at steinberg.de. Okay, and I'm just saying uh, some continued discussion from Scambot about latency for guitars uh, and still having issues with the vocal mic. You know, one of the things to check Scambot is, you know, there's always going to be this uh, constrained delay compensation. So realize that if when you're tracking with plugins, that unless you have a DSP-assisted audio interface like the Steinberg UR, MR, series that you know anytime that you instantiate a plugin it's going to cause latency so uh if you wanted to tr basically bypass plugins that are causing a lot of latency like when you're tracking you could click on this constrained delay compensation in the lower left hand corner and that will basically bypass uh plugins that are causing a lot of latency in your system so give that a try to Um, so to see question, uh, will Cubase look to have step MIDI for drum mapping? So for, you know, you could do drum parts via step entry already quite easily. So if I just wanted to come here, let's say if I go to the drum editor, um, so let me just thought we...
So if I just wanted to come here to step input, uh, so let's say if I wanted to activate my step input, I may have to just, let's say if we go to, so I could just come right over here and as we enter in notes, let me just, you know, so it's gonna be handled kind of the same way with your step entry for drum parts. Let's see, my cue base is not misbehaving. All right, so. All right, so let me see if I could exit out of my cue base here quickly. Let's see if I can do a quick force quit on it. Okay. Bear with me just a second. All right, I'm just gonna reboot my computer really quick. Sometimes with OBS running, it'll do this. So bear with me just for like two minutes and I'll get my computer rebooted. And so just hang on for just a second. I'm just gonna restart. All right, I'm just gonna check, make sure we have audio back. Okay, just getting my audio interfaces or slowly coming back to life here. Give me one second. Sorry, my audio interface wasn't seen on on import, so I think we're almost ready. Give me okay. Okay, just gonna do a quick test here, make sure we have audio going out. Gonna just monitor, make sure I have audio going out. And then we'll get started here in just a second. So I make sure I don't present for 20 minutes without audio. Okay, all right, so sorry about that. All right, so let's go back to our questions. Um, 
So we see a question. Uh, hi, Greg. Can I quickly swap to position at two events in a track, for example, drum fills, which I might want to hear in different spots without having to drag reposition every time? So if we want it to, uh, let's say if I have two different parts, let's say like this, and I wanted to reposition them, what we could do is set the uh, grid to events. And then as I just move this one, uh, let's see if I move this one, we just, or we'll put it into shuffle mode. So now as I move this one forward, let's just go ahead and I'll, change the color of one of these so it's a little more obvious so let's say i make this one red and this one blue so as soon as i drag this one over those two events will just kind of uh shuffle between the two events so i move that to the back then the red's going to be in the front so check out the grid put it to shuffle and then just kind of uh swap the two like so. So move it to the back, then those two events will kind of just swap places. So again, change, change the uh, grid type to shuffle. All right, so let's go to the next question. Um, Okay, so we see Crystal Coast, North Carolina checking in. Haven't missed anything, uh, just haven't been live. All right, so good to have you on the Hangout. Uh, question, when exporting multiple stems, is there a way to direct each stem to follow the entire signal path, including uh, master inserts? <clears throat> so when we do the batch export here, we could choose to just have uh, our you know, when we do our audio mix down here, we could have all of our effect, all of the tracks exported separately. If you wanted to include that with the effects, uh, but it's not going to include like the effects from, you know, the master of the master of bus. So if I come here, I'm going to set up just a quick export here, but you could do it through like a render in place. So let's say, if I wanted to come here and let's say on my master, I wanted to have like, uh, do something horrible and obvious, like maybe, you know, a flanger on the entire mix. So when I come here and let's say I just want to do these tracks, uh, and I will just come here to edit and I will choose to do a render in place. So what I could do is just say, I want to render settings and I want to include the whole signal path. So at this point, when I render those particular tracks and you do this for, you could render multiple tracks easily with this. Uh, and when we have our stereo out at this point, um, you could just have everything just rendered. So just choose to do a render in place and you could do that for, you know, multiply selected parts. So if you just say, I just want it, you know, these, you know, you know, these particular parts and render with all the effects, uh, you go to your render settings So under edit uh, to render place and you just tell it what you want to include. So you could do by the tracks or individual parts. So however you wanted to do it. Uh, so question, hi Greg, Lisa from Germany. Can you explain how to equalize the voice right, please? Um, so there's no perfect way to EQ a voice. I'm just gonna check. Something here real quick. 
bear with me just a minute. Right, so I just got an email, but I just want to make sure that the stream is playing back here. Uh, looks like it's playing back on my computer. Just uh, just going to check again, just to make sure. I'm gonna check on another computer. So I just got an email sent to me, so I just want to make sure I'm not broadcasting with without. All right, so it seems like it's working okay. If not, uh, send me a, a quick message and let me know if the audio is not working, but I'll just wait a second and make sure that change I just did is going to reflect before moving on. Because one time I did like 20 minutes of a hangout. Okay, so it looks like that's kind of working as expected. Just to Okay, so it looks like that's all kind of functioning. All right. Okay, sorry about that hang up. All right, so, uh, so about how to make the voice, how to make the EQ to voice right. And this could be different for every project, unfortunately. Um, so some things that you could do to make a project stand out a bit more is just to make sure that it's going to be, um, you know, I, a lot of people I know will cut all low end for a, a particular track. So let's say... So I'll go ahead and look at this track here. So I rolled off low end. I often kind of boost the frequencies. And one of the things you could do is, one, if you know what the key of the song is, that could be really essential. So if I wanted to come here. So here I'm in the key of uh, A flat. So when I go to my EQ, you know, one of the things that you could do is actually just type in the frequency here. So you could say, I want to go to uh, A flat 5. And that will take you to that particular frequency. So you can kind of EQ within the key of the song. So let's say I wanted to be A flat 7. I've got to choose. And that way you could, you know, because what you want to do is to accentuate frequencies probably that are related to the key of the song and the notes that are being sung. Um, so if you do that, um, you should be able to, you know, that will help the EQ quite a bit. So, you know, making sure that you're EQing the right frequencies for the particular song. So a, the EQ frequencies for a song in the key of D it's going to be very different than EQ frequencies for a song in the key of G or A. So if, when you go to the frequency, you know, if you know what the key of the song is and just come over here and just type in, you know, A flat three, and that will take you to that particular frequency range. And at that point you could just, you know, adjust. Uh, so that's one tip that I, I could really give, but you know, I see some people try so hard you know, to, you know, obviously if you could capture the, you know, the, the, the vocal at the source, that would be like a, a great way to do it. Uh, but that's not always the most ideal situation. Uh, you don't have that luxury if you're mixing, but you know, when you're, you know, if you figure out what the key is of the song, you know, use those particular frequency ranges and just type in a flat seven, a flat six and C what that does for you as opposed to EQing kind of just a random frequency. I see so many uh, like colleges and kids coming out of colleges and they're like, oh, we have to EQ this frequency because it works. It's like, you know, what if the song's in a different key? You know, those frequencies probably won't make any sense or won't work, you know, if it's a different key. And they're like, oh, I didn't think about that. So, you know, just type in the note name here 
and experiment and EQ based on the pitch of the actual song. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead. Um, okay, so we see Alan checking in from uh, New Jersey, always in the background. So thanks for popping out in the foreground and saying hi, Alan. Glad to have you on the Hangout. Uh, so I just see my audio shows two lines instead of one. Can anyone tell me how to change that? Um, so, you know, if you see two lines, something kind of like this, uh, you know, where you see two waveforms, that would indicate that that file is in stereo versus uh, if you see one waveform mono, so make sure that as you're recording, you know, if it's the two waveforms that we see here on top of each other, that would be like stereo. That's the left and right channels. Uh, and then you're going to have the a mono channel directly here. So those are some. So I'm not sure if that, that's the one or two lines that you're talking about. Okay, so I just see, uh, hi Greg, is there any tutorial how to approach mixing music in surround setting in Cubase? Uh, I guess there would be too much questions for this Hangout. Yeah, and sometimes it's hard to do a surround video when uh, as you're only listening to it in stereo. Uh, but some of the things to, you know, and there's different schools of thought, and I've, I've been fortunate to work a lot with different surround sound pioneers and the guys that, you know, like, you know, in the 90s that were doing like some amazing work, you know, like, you know, two of my favorite guys are uh, for surround or Elliot Shiner. Uh, I think his work is just stunning. I remember hearing his mix of Steely Dan Gaucho uh, and sitting down for I think it was Babylon Sisters. And you're just listening to Donald Fagan's voice solo in the uh, center channel and then all of a sudden when the uh, horns and background singers come in during the chorus they're in the surround speakers but if you talk to all the different sur people that are doing surround work uh, you realize that some people try to you know create a um, more of a live ambience like if you're doing you know if you listen to uh, Chuck Ainley's, uh 5 one remix of Frampton Comes Alive or he's trying to recreate a concert experience you know that's a very different thing you know uh, Chuck and Frank Phil Petty my friends uh, they both did like wonderful concert stuff and Elliot Shiner did a uh, wonderful job with like the Eagles and Fleetwood Mac uh, you know in 5 one surround and, uh, but you know, some, some tips that you could do is, you know, make sure that, you know, you could have different reverbs in the back. So when you go to add a, you know, if you have a five, one setup, so you want to come over here and I, I love mixing in five, one. So, um, and a big proponent of it. But once you have kind of, let's say your connections here, so let's say I have my outputs and I have my output bus here. Let me just add a 5.1 bus. And, you know, now that I have a particular track, I'll add audio track and we're gonna send it out to my 5.1 out. And once I have that done, I, I'm just gonna pop right over here and now when I go to double click we'll have our surround panner but the one thing that to make sure of when you go to add effects is that you could have effects that work in 5.1 but you know we could add an effects channel track uh, and then you could send it out to your 5.1 out but your 5.1 out something that's handy is you may want to have like separate effects in your surround speakers versus what's going on so you could go to 
uh, your 5-1 out here. And then you could, uh, if you select this, we could also say let's add a child bus. And we can say our stereo left surround, right surround. So when I go to add an effects channel track at this point, uh, we could have just a uh, a plugin that's going to work only in the rear and right speakers or in the left and right surround speakers. So I'm going to add an effects channel and I will choose it to go to my child bus. And that way this reverb could be only in the back center. So you may want to have like the vocal, you know, isolated dry in the center channel. You may want to have left and right a little bit of reverb and maybe a slightly different reverb or ambience in the rear speakers. So this way you could have your different effects uh, throughout your 5.1 mix. And, you know, Elliot Shiner, I remember him telling me once, he's like, you know, at some point, you know, and he also did like, you know, Bohemian Rhapsody and Queen's A Night at the Opera. He remixed that in 5.1, which is pretty stunning. Uh, but, you know, and he's like, at some point you have to make something, you know, swirl around the room to make someone feel good about having surround. So, you know, for a particular effect. But it's, I wish I could spend more time, but if you can't really hear it in surround as I go through it, it's uh, a little annoying to just describe it. So, but hopefully that will give you some additional tips and some ideas. So I just see a comment from Jeff recently got absolute and love everything. That's great. Uh, so I see Ace. Uh, hi, Greg. How can I clone an entire Cubase 10.5 project and all of its subfolders, waves, edits, sound pool, et cetera, to a new folder without it complaining it needs access info from previous uh, original folder? Uh, so, you know, what you could do is, you know, you could obviously just copy the folder if you wanted to and open up the project from there. But, you know, another thing you could do is just go to your file and choose backup project. And what the backup project will allow you to do is it, you'll be asked to define a new folder. So we'll just give it a beautiful name. I will come here and hit open and then you'll have different uh, options. So you could give it a different name. So if you want this to be archive or backup, you could minimize the audio file. So let's say if you, uh, you know, had, you know, 400 extra vocal takes, you know, and, or you're only using three seconds of a four minute recording. If you choose to minimize the audio files, it wouldn't copy over any audio files that aren't needed. Um, you could make all the direct offline processes permanent if you wanted to. You could remove unused files and you could choose not to back up the video file. And once you do that, that will make kind of a perfect brand new fresh copy. So I would do that. So just go to your file to backup project and you should be all set. Okay. And just saying comment, this may be going about the latency for tracking vocals. Then this comment from Gareth, uh, K Music. Sometimes I'll put a light compressor on the input just to tame some of the loudest parts, but I otherwise usually record dry with insert effects if a singer needs to hear them. So that's good. Uh, you know, that's exactly what I would do. So. Okay. Okay, so seeing some of our discussion about people's different hardware settings for latency. Uh, so I see a question from Michael Harvey. Is there any talk or consideration for adding uh, multi-channel audio warp in a list of things going into Cubase 11? It's been mentioned a lot, so uh, we'll have to see what comes out in version 11. So. OK, 
Okay. I just see uh, Gareth K. Music. Does anybody have the AXR4? So I have one. So it's a. Uh, so it is, you know, and it's one of the cool things with the mic pre's on the AXR4 is it does feature the Rupert Neve silk modeling. So that's actually authorized by Rupert Neve and Rupert Neve Designs themselves. So, all right. All right, just reading through different comments. Uh, Thanks for all the great discussion. And again, if you learned something new, make sure you give a thumbs up. Um, all right, so I just see a comment, and this may be with our earlier discussion. Uh, do you have to do a lot of slicing and then volume adjustments when the proximity of the microphone is inconsistency or is inconsistent? So yeah, you know, it depends on the part. So, you know, if you're doing dialogue editing where maybe it's not the most ideal situation or you're doing lots of cleanup or forensic or uh, what they call investigational audio now, you know, you may have to kind of go through different dialogue and as we showed earlier, kind of, you know, splitting it and raising it to, you know, have a consistent level where compressor could work a little bit better to glue it together. Okay. Um, so I just see why does the sound source always go back to default when while I reloading the project uh, from Kin? Um, so I'm not sure if it's the audio interface, uh, but it, you know, it maybe it's that's how it's kind of saved uh within the project so okay so i just see a comment from uh andy i know this is a cubase hangout but is uh will there be a halion will there be any halion six hangouts i would like to get uh round robin working with the very groups uh, if you want to send me an email, um, I could have it uh, a project set up for the Hangout on Friday, Andy. So, um, so and if you want to just send me a quick email at uh, you can send it to clubcubase at steinberg .de. I may have to. I don't want to spend twenty minutes kind of setting up a, a scenario for round robins, but I know we could get it going pretty easily. Uh, but I'd be helpful if I had some samples prepared for it, but uh, send that send that to me and I'll make a note to have that prepared for the next Hangout. Okay, uh, can you explain direct routing in some detail? So we kind of touched on this a little earlier and what direct routing is also really great for is doing you know the parallel processing so if i wanted to come to this and i'm just going to take my flanger off my drums because it seemed like such a good idea for showing that one feature okay so if i wanted to take the drums here and do you know, different uh, processing. So I'm going to, let's say I'll just boost all my drums volumes up here. And now what I want to do is add two group tracks. So I'll just right click and let's add a group track. We're going to make two stereo groups. And what I want to do is so with our direct routing, which we could access from kind of the larger mix console and racks. And let me just hide my inputs for this. So I'm gonna send all these to 
group one and to group two. So I will hold down, you select all the channels, all my drums. So now all these will be routed to group one. And if I turn on direct mode summing, so this is useful if I wanted to have like different processing. So let's say on my group two, I wanted to have like really heavy squashed compression. So now what I could do is just automate. So I could send to that device. So let's say I wanted to go back to group one and to group two. So now if I choose to, we'll just rewind a little bit here. So we will have that those automated. But if I wanted to combine those two, I would put direct routing summing mode on from here. And once we have that direct routing summing mode, I could send to, you know, multiple destinations simultaneously. So I'm going to come here and activate all of so now it's gonna to go to two different devices. And let me just, okay. So now we could have a parallel process set up. So we're gonna activate both of the groups. And we could have parallel processing. So th this is going out to this group and to this group at the same time. So that's you know a lot of the great things that you could do is being able to send different devices, different tracks to different groups with and dynamically within a mix, and that's some of the advantages that you have of doing the uh, direct uh, routing options. All right, I'm back. That I'm glad to see that I am back to being La Leche. All right, so happy about that. Okay, uh, can you explain a little about efficient use of quick controls? Okay, so once we have quick controls set up, we would go to your studio menu and we would go to our quick controls settings under studio setup. And what I want to do here is to go to my track quick control settings. And here I've defined my input and output and I have eight sliders on my computer keyboard. And I could do a learn and move a slider. And that would capture that MIDI CC data. So if I come here, let's say uh, I'm at 45, I move the slider out of my Nectar Panorama controller, and that's going to be 40. So now I could go to my quick controls. And for each of the tracks, I could just say, OK, I want it, my kick track. And there's different presets. So I could say I want volume pan. So uh, as I come here, I could take my quick control one is just my volume. I could pan left and right with slider two. I could also come over and have different settings for EQ. So I want to turn on EQ one and be able to adjust the EQ accordingly or EQ two, three, and four or my sends level. So as soon as I come here, I could adjust 
you know, my panning, we could see just by hitting the same sliders. And on every track, we could have these same quick controls set up. So if I wanted this kick, let's go to the snare. And there's presets that you could make. So let's say if I have a particular uh, setting on a plugin. So let's say if I'm here, uh, I have my insert. I could say, let's go to, uh, let's say I have under distortion, I have the VSD bass amp on, and I wanted this just to do, uh, let's say our gain. So what I could do with my quick controls is I could click on learn and I could just move a parameter. And then that parameter is assigned to quick control slot one. So if I just want to come here, and let's say I wanted this to be treble, to be quick control slot two, I could stop, uh, activate that slot, have this learn turned on, move that, and now as I do this, And that will just kind of control those different parameters. So you could have quick controls also just kind of set up. So, you know, if you wanted to define quick controls for any parameter as well, you could say, okay, I wanted to go to my input filter and I want it pre-gain. I wanted to come here and on my inserts for this, I want to go to my VSD bass amp and let's go to speaker and cabinet. And I want it mic type one to be on. So you could define these and save them as presets. So you could just simply call them up and have kind of complete control uh, over those things. So you have kind of the eight defined parameters. And once those parameters are defined, you have the ability to control any eight parameters very fast using quick controls. Okay. So just seeing a comment from Jeff, uh, the command control or, uh, and then click is a very handy everywhere to zero out and works on all plugins too. It's great. Yeah. So it's a really handy tip to know. Okay. Uh, so we see question, Hey Greg, how do you take a track from one project and put it in another? So there's a couple different ways. Uh, one is if you wanted to take the track and all of its settings, it's just go to import, uh, tracks from project. And at this point you could say, I wanted to go to this particular project. I could select a track and just hit OK, and that would automatically insert that particular track uh, into this one. Hang on, I have my son knocking on the door. Let me just uh, see if he needs help real quick. I'll be right back. All right, so sorry about that. So that's one way is just doing the file import tracks from project. Um, but you could also just kind of take audio from, you know, one project here and just, you know, like if you just want a, a part, you can say, you know, I really like this part and I want that part into this project and just drag and drop as well. So you got multiple projects open and drag and drop between them.
Okay, so we have a question. Hey, Greg, is it possible to set move a phrase or, or a section of vocal to one note on Vary Audio with a click on the keyboard? So if you wanted to like drive the, uh, so let's say if you wanted to take, uh, to select the pitch from the keyboard. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, so I will go to, uh, my very audio editor here and we'll do its analysis and so I will come over here and within the very audio you could also just say uh, MIDI input so as I would select a particular note here so let's say Right. That let's say if I activate MIDI input, I could just come over here and just play my MIDI keyboard and change the pitch. Okay, so, and so that's, and if I want to do that for multiple pitches, I could just raise based just like that. So make sure that you, once you have the very audio open, that you click on MIDI input, and then you could just uh, hit the keyboard and that will set the phrase or doing it just like that, so. Okay, so we see uh, Jay checking in. Hi, Greg. Sorry I'm late. Fantastic job you're doing. Thank you. You don't have to apologize for being late. It's not school. You don't get a tardy. So, but uh, we're glad to have you on the Hangout, Jay. Okay, so question. How to filter a MIDI track to record only on a selected channel? Cleaning up each time with a logical editing. Editor is tiring. Hang on. My son needs me one more time. All right, my son brought me a jelly bean. That was nice of him. Okay, um, so how to filter a MIDI track to record only on selected channel, cleaning up uh, each time. So, you know, probably the easiest thing is to make sure your controller is not. And uh, I'll just go to MIDI track. And you can see on the input transformer, We'll go to local and there's going to be presets for this where you can say channel filtering. So you can say pass channel one and that will filter out everything that's not on channel one. So you want to make sure that that is active. So again, go to your input transformer. You can set it to local or to global. And one of the presets uh, you'll have is channel filtering and then you could pass only that particular channel, but make sure that this is turned on as well. But you know, if a lot of times when this happens is when MIDI controllers are set up for, we get this a lot with like stacked preset that's transmitting on eight MIDI channels. And then all of a sudden you're recording, you're transmitting eight MIDI channels. So, you know, ideally if you have the controller set up to only transmit one MIDI channel, then Cubase could remap it, but you could do it through the logical, through the input transformer.
Okay, so to see question hi all since Cubase 11 was asked for, I'd rather see like to see some more frequent 10.5 updates for a while. So there's a lot of updates that you know uh, come after the you know the next generation is released as well. So there's always stuff. So. Okay, so hello, Greg. Is there a way to assign a button on my controller to open the instrument of the selected track? So we could come over here. We could do this through the generic remote. And we could say uh, under generic remote, so we say whatever MIDI message you want at top. And what we want to do is probably a command and maybe under edit and I think it's going to be like edit VST instrument so this way you can say you know when I hit this controller uh, and then it's going to this MIDI message incoming MIDI message and make sure that you have these set appropriately this incoming MIDI message is going to automatically run a command in the edit category that is edit VST instrument. So that way, every time you do that, you hit that button. Uh, you could, if as long as that transmits MIDI, that would open up th that command in Cubase for you globally. Uh, so I see, um, hi Greg, is it possible to start a specific instrument with a, just for that command? Um, so, um, you know, you could, the, the, you could do a macro to start instruments, but I'm not sure if this is referring maybe to a previous question that was in the past, uh, but, um, but, you know, you could do it for specific uh, you know, you could load up track presets with instruments, but I'm not sure if you wanted to, uh, so starting a specific instrument, um, you know, from a generic remote or if how you wanted to do that, but it could be like where you could save a, you know, start a particular track preset. Okay, so I see a question. Hello, do you also have tutorials for Nuendo 10? You know, yeah, so we have, there's lots of tutorials for Nuendo 10. I've done a number of tutorials. There's also, uh, you know, everything that we see in Cubase is also applicable to Nuendo as well. So, um, so everything you're seeing here is in Nuendo and just as applicable. And if you have a specific uh, Nuendo question, just feel free to ask, you know, we'll take any questions here. Uh, so I see what's the difference with live mode. So live mode is kind of looking at, trying to do as much looking ahead in the signal as possible. And that minimizes the latency. So it does take more processing power. Uh, so that, but it will kind of speed up the, you know, so, you know, the, the trade-off is more processing power, and the benefit is that if you're tracking with live mode, like on a multiband compressor, um, you know, at that point you could, you know, so that, that, you know, so the benefit is, you know, the lower latency mode, but it's also higher CPU. Okay, so I see Jason uh, says regarding logical editors, say select one note, example C3. Can you say value one unequal to C3 and all other notes are selected, deleted, etc.? You could do that. So you could choose to, um, uh, you, you could do it that way. You could say notes unequal to C3. Um, so. And I'm not sure if this is getting back to the previous question we had about, you know, getting rid of all C's. 
Uh, but a lot of times you, you could define uh, like a C3, but if you wanted a C4, a C2, a C5 in, to not be affected, if you wanted the pitch of C to not be affected, that's why you could uh, define the actual note. Okay. Okay, so nice comment from Millard Brown. Got to say, I really appreciate the level of knowledge and help from all here, especially Greg. You're welcome. We're just glad that I think this is a wonderful resource for people and appreciate everyone else who's able to help as well. So I think it's really beneficial for our users. Uh, and Michael is telling people to whack the like button again. So, okay. Okay, so it says, uh, from Scambot, it says, thanks again, Greg. If you had a beard, you'd be the beard of Cubase knowledge. Your insight in Cubase is tremendous and goes a long ways in helping everyone learn aspects of Cubase. Uh, I'm just glad that I'm able to help, so I probably just made more mistakes than other people have earlier, So and get to share my experiences. So it's glad to be able to help people uh, realize their creativity. Okay. Yeah, and I never did try to grow the beard, so even during pandemic. Okay, we see Gareth is going to feed his daughter. She one time piped into the convers into the hangout, tell us that dad needed to feed her, so um Uh, so you see, hi, sorry for this question if it's totally non-sync, uh, but can you suggest best, best laptops to get for using Cubase? You know, I, the MacBook Pro is a, is a wonderful notebook. You know, there, there's some things that are brilliant about it and some things are just incredibly annoying, kind of like any machine. Um, so I like that you could have 32 gigs of RAM in it. You know, you, uh, the the ability that you only have USB-C ports is kind of a drag, so you have to carry a lot of adapters around. Um, I also, I have an old Music XPC and i7 la Windows laptop with 16 gigs of RAM. I've had it almost seven years, and that still runs great. So I, I found, you know, if you get some of the, uh, like, you know, if you check out... I haven't explored a lot of, uh, like Dell's I've run HP's in the past. Uh, we were going to be doing some exchanging and auditioning some Dell hardware right before the pandemic, but we, uh, but we were supposed to get together and that kind of fell through with the COVID stuff. But, um, you know, I think any, if you got like an I nine machine, if you could do it with like 32 gigs of Ram, you're in great shape. I know Teddy Riley, uh, last time I was at his studio, he has, cause he's always kind of tweaking out laptops and I think he had like an Asus laptop, an i9 and he had like, you know, a bunch of different drives in it and it was a beast of a laptop. Um, so, but you know, if you get like an i9 with 32 gigs of RAM and a terabyte SSD, if you could find one with, um, you know, with Thunderbolt, that's helpful to, uh, that gives you a lot of options and a USB-C port. So, Okay, so I see a question from Jason. Uh, are profiles stored on the license key? So currently the license key only stores the license and the profile is just a, a file that you could email or put on like a Google Drive or something like a, a cloud service as well that you could do quite easily. So, but it's not actually stored on the license key, just the memories. And seeing uh, Miller just mentioning, says, you know, uh, for Windows i7, 16 gigabytes of memory, USB 3. Those are all great things to be looking for. Okay. And Miller likes HP and Lenovo, so... I've used HP laptops a lot in the past, so I've had great luck with them. OK. 
Okay. Okay, so uh, it says how to uh, warp like Ableton and use the media bay. I have many samples, like more than 100 gigs, and whenever I import it from favorites, its pitch and tempo are wrong. How can I make it like Ableton? So I'm not familiar with Ableton, but let's go ahead and just kind of start a particular project. Um, so I'll just do a new project here. Okay, so let's say I just want to start with uh, some different beats. Okay, so let's say I just want to drag that in. Um, so now if I just place this into musical mode, it's going to automatically just kind of... I will take this and let's just, yeah, let's say I just want to speed up the tempo here. So let's say it's going to be 140. And then you could align beats. So let's say I just wanted to kind of come right over here and say I wanted to find, you know, maybe arpeggios. So. And as I just kind of drag that in, uh, I'll just make a copy of that. drag that in. So stuff like this that so you could just kind of automatically place them all in musical mode. So stuff like that you could do quite easily kind of, and you know, once it's in musical mode, it's automatically just going to follow whatever tempo you throw at it. So say, I want this all to be. So just kind of give you a quick idea, of some of the stuff you could do. So uh, I don't think it's that hard to work with and we have people, you know, have, you know, terabytes of samples and loops. Okay. Um, so I see from Tamne Mandel, Mandel uh, in combined selection tools, how to range selection tool activation area is small. You know, it could just start from the top. You know, if you have... You know, something like this, uh, it could be hard to do the selection. But if you, you know, have a part, you know, once you're, you know, in the combined modes, you just kind of start from the top for the selection and start from, for the range tool rather, and start from the bottom 
uh, for object selection. So at this point, you could just say, okay, I just want to select this range from the top, or I wanted to select those events from the bottom. But, you know, realize that if the event that you're starting with is super small in height that, you know, it's like having a strike zone on a, you know, someone who's incredibly short, I would imagine, as a pitcher, you know. So you just have to kind of maybe give it a little more space uh, to initially start. All right. So we had some questions that were sent in. Let me get to some of those. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. If you... uh, have learned something new, make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that. Okay, so um, okay, so this question, uh, how can I quantize a full old song from 1978? Is there a tool in Cubase to flatten it? Flatten it temporary doesn't work well, or maybe I don't understand how it works. Um, so this is, I think, dealing with a audio file. So you want to take a whole song and kind of regulate the tempo where maybe it was speeding up and slowing down. So let's take a look at that. I will see if I... Okay, so we have an example track here. So let's say there's no correlation in the tempo to what's going on musically. So what I want to do is select the file, go to my project, to tempo detection, and we'll say analyze. And then I want to just So we've done a tempo detection of the event. It's figured out what the tempo is. I'm going to, and it does this, it figures out what the beats are. And it's going to give us a time signature of, of uh, one four. And what I need to do is to just come over here and define where the downbeat is. Now, as we look at this particular file, we can see that there's basically tempo changes on every single beat of that particular track. And so if I wanted this to, instead of having these crazy tempo changes, I wanted this to be perfectly steady, I would go to my audio menu to advanced. And then at this point, I would choose to set definition from tempo. And what this is going to do is embed these tempo changes of every single beat into this particular file. So we're probably about 144. So what I'm gonna do now is turn off this and say I want it to be a perfect 144 beats a minute. And that's kind of a rough ballpark. And as I just wanted to type in, now it's gonna play back perfectly at 144 BPM. If I want it to be 120. So we can see the original tempo here and our actual tempo that's playing back. So if I want it to be 156, maybe a little faster. 148, so it's basically, and you can do this on a multi-track as well. So now it's perfectly steady tempo of the music. So once again, once you've done the tempo detection, go to your audio menu to advanced and then you want to set definition from tempo okay so we got uh got a number of messages from uh ben says um after fighting with a mid 2015 macbook pro and catalina uh and overheating and kernel panics i'm setting in with a 3.2 gigahertz 32 gigabyte mini and sticking with Mojave works like a charm except I'm losing control of my UR24 my UR242 uh, Cubase's audio from a mic plugged in even though the volume control is turned all the way to off uh, where is the operator air please um, so I'll try to in this is from uh, Ben Daub from Toronto um, so I'll try to email you. I know you had you sent a lot of different uh, updates with this. Um, 
but it's, you know, some of the mics will, you know, be able to pass, you know, depending on the gain structure of the mic, you know, you may not need the added gain of the UR22 for it to see signal. So if you have a line level signal going in, you know, you will see signal despite, you know, the volume being down. So that's just kind of like a mic pre volume, you know, and if you have something like, you know, like a mic that has a low output volume, something like a maybe a, a Shure SM7B, you know, that you'd probably have to crank up. But depending upon your actual mic that you're using, that may, uh, you know, may have enough output where you don't need to have uh, the mic, the, you know, the mic pre enabled to see the signal. So that's fine to see signal without the mic uh, gain up. Uh, and I think we got some, I got some questions from Taylor who I emailed earlier where he sent me some YouTube videos, but they, uh, they were private. So I wasn't able to see those. So hopefully Taylor, if you, if you're still on a hangout, maybe you could still, uh, make it so that those are available for me to see. Okay. So, um, so we see, hi Greg, uh, thanks for replying to my question at the last hangout regarding uh, non-working Steinberg instruments. Unfortunately, you misread my question. My problem is with the standalone versions of the instruments. And this was getting uh, like the MIDI going on different standalone instruments like Halion, the Grand. So let me just open one up here. Um, So I think we'll have, um, so let's say if I wanted to go to Halion 6 here, I will open this up in standalone mode, not as a plugin. And I'll just run it through a different audio interface, just so, um, as this one's being used. So I'm gonna choose, uh, I'll just load up a particular sound And I'm gonna go to my preferences. And what I wanna do is to route this to, let's say my USB audio codec, all right? And, and then for MIDI, um, you know, we could say all MIDI inputs, but I can see my panorama. Now, just try with the, and then I'll just choose the interface there. And now, um, but just kind of, you know, coming directly here to, let's say the plugin preferences. So make sure that you have this set. So you can say, okay, I want my USB, uh, audio codec, I wanted to keep that. I wanted to have the outputs defined, let's say, you know, from left and right. And, you know, so if you click here on the little settings, but, and that's just kind of going through my little desktop speakers. Uh, you may hear it on a microphone, but. And if I wanted to switch that to, let's say, the same audio interface that you guys could hear, I'll get to the ASIO driver and switch it to this. And now I will just go to the not connected here and we'll. So it seems like the instruments kind of work as expected, but maybe come over here and go to the preferences and make sure that you have the output set here and see if that makes a difference for you. But I tried the other instruments and they all kind of worked uh, the same way. All right, so let's move on. Okay. Okay, so uh, it says, um, 
I have a question. I've been trying to unsuccessfully create a custom macro that will give me control of a pitch envelope on specific regions as clean uh, as on logic. So let's say uh, what they want to do is like a type of pitch envelope change. So uh, when I come here, I think I had this set up. So let's say I have an audio file here. Okay. So let's say I'll just kind of play this. So let's say that last note, I just want to do like a, a pitch drive, like a pitch kind of effect. I would just kind of select, you know, we could do it a couple different ways, but the, an easy way is to just, uh, I set up a key command um, just to come over here and under processes, So under processes, and you could just open up the pitch shift. Uh, I think I did like command option P, command option shift P. So at this point, I could just hit um, that. And I have just a, like a quick pitch drop like this, and I didn't have it set to time correction. So I selected just a range of it, and now it's automatically been applied just by hitting that key sh keyboard shortcut. So. So that way you could just, and once you have this set up, that those settings will automatically change. So if I wanted to undo that, um, I'll just delete that process again. So we'd listen to it. So, and again, just coming right over here, hitting that keyboard shortcut. So once that range is selected, And you could set that for more semitones if you wanted to. So we say, okay, I want that to be 12. Uh, and now as we, you know, so I, you know, and I, I watched the video that you had sent as a reference and I think that kind of works the same way. So, you know, there's different, uh, you know, algorithms that you could use, but, you know, definitely try just a quick pitch shift. And, you know, that way you could just have one keyboard shortcut. You don't have to, do, you know, select a range, fire up that one keyboard shortcut. And if you do that type of effect a lot, you know, you could just keep that uh, set and be able to do that very fast. So. All right. So I think that was from Gil, who was on a hangout earlier. So hopefully he's still on. Um, Okay, so we got this question. Uh, hi, Greg. Could you tell us why Cubase use of memory shows in such high percentage? I use a Mac and a program called Stats. When nothing is going on, the use is 200 to 300%. When a session is bigger, it can go up to 1,500%. I believe it's the processor use, but I'm not sure. On top of it, while I have the chance after upgrading Cubase 10.5, some of my key shortcuts no longer work. And if they show up in a key commands list, in particular, the keystroke I have for tempo input shift T. Thank you. Um, so I, you know, I'm not familiar with the program stats to, um, you know, but it seems like those numbers don't make any sense. Um, but you can pull up probably the activity monitor may give you more of an indication. And sometimes the activity monitor doesn't show scaling and it also doesn't have the effect of, you know, running at a low, you know, adjusting the buffer size of your audio interface. Uh, as far as the key command, you know, when I go to hit shift T myself, um, you know, that goes straight by default to the tempos. So uh, just make sure that you have that defined in the key commands and you could just uh, select right here and hit shift T. At that point, you know, you say transport, enter tempo, and make sure that that assignment is there. Um, 
and you should be all set. But by default, you know, if it's not set up, you could reset it or maybe it's being used for, you know, more than one particular function. So, all right. So I'm going to go back to our live feed. Thanks everyone for sending in questions in advance. And if you want to submit questions in advance for future Hangouts, please feel free to uh, reach out to Club Cubase at Steinberg.de. Um, okay, so let's move on. Okay. So we see a uh, question, is Steinberg a Yamaha company? So yes, yeah, Steinberg uh, was acquired by Yamaha in, uh, it was announced in December 2004. Uh, and so since January 2005 is when uh, Steinberg was officially acquired. When the deal was done, it was actually handled at the NAM show, which is a big industry trade show for music industry uh, that happens in January in uh, Anaheim, California. You know, so it was kind of interesting. I went in as a Pinnacle employee during the show and was turned into a Yamaha employee at the end of the show. So I was able to kind of transition. So I've been with Yamaha for over 15 years and Steinberg for uh, over 28 at this point. Okay, so, but yeah, we're in, we're, you know, but Steinberg is part of the Yamaha family, as is Line 6 and Ampeg and Nexo speakers and uh, Bosendorfer pianos. Those are all kind of Yamaha brands at this point. Um, so I just see a question, is there any way to quick key instruments? Um, so I'm not sure what you mean by quick key there's quick controls for the instruments. Uh, so if you have an instrument track, you know, you could have your quick controls for uh, various uh, instruments and various settings that you'll see here. So if I wanted to come here, we could see our quick controls that could be configured. Um, but I'm not sure what the quick key instruments, what you mean by that. So maybe if you could reiterate. Okay, let's see how we're doing on time. So we're doing pretty well. I was like 20 seconds over the last one and we lost our uh, automatic closed captioning. So I'm going to try to not do that today. Okay. Okay, my chat jumped, so let me just uh, jump back. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. Okay, so I think I'm back to where I was. Um, See comment from Gareth. I hope the export options for score sheets will be improved in version 11. So we'll have to see what happens. Okay. Sub 403 sound everyone to hit the like button. Um, See a uh, comment from Elite on a beat. Hard to believe Greg learns anything new from Cubase. He practically has it all memorized inside and out. LOL. So, yeah, I learn something new every Hangout, um, you know, or just think about a different approach to things. So, okay. So, I see Jeff uh, saying he's been using Cubase since before SX. Um,
Okay, just going through comments. Um, okay. Good to see Sir Robert on a hangout from Atlanta. Um, Okay, so uh, hi Greg, is there an option to transpose a complete chord track instead of doing manually one chord at a time? So we thought that that would be a bummer as well. So we'll show you a trick. Uh, so this has a chord track in it. So if I have a chord track, I'm just going to hold down a shift key and double click, and that will select all the chords. We could go to the root key, and then just using my mouse scroll wheel, we could go up or down and transpose just like that. So I'll make this a little larger, so maybe easier to see. So just grab the root key, and using the mouse scroll wheel, just go up and down and that's how you could transpose all the chords without having to do it once at a time. I see a comment from Agent K typing the note in the EQ is amazing. It's a super great trick. So I love that. Um, and as Rob, Sir Robert says, it's well worth the price of admission. Okay, I, I see a uh, best example for real DTS around is Alan Parsons on air. Try to hear it with a real 5.1 home cinema system. Yeah, Alan does also wonderful stuff and he's a big Cubase nut. And also he's really into WaveLab as well. So he, he's done great stuff. And I think it was his quad version of Dark Side of the Moon that inspired everyone to, to really get into all the... Um, more, you know, extensive surround, you know, 15, 20 years later. Um, so I see, is there any possibility to start a specific VST instrument with just one key command? So I don't know a way to start um, with just a particular key to load up, let's say this instrument, um, but I'll see if I could come up with a macro to maybe come up with something but track presets as jazz dude noticed um are also pretty helpful for that um so question again so is there a way to export stems with the master effects on them so using the render in place that would do it for you uh, we showed it a little bit earlier Okay. Okay, so hi Greg, uh, when using a chord track, MIDI or instrument tracks that have no MIDI data seem to play chords following the chord track, I don't want this to happen. What am I doing wrong? So when you have the chord track, you probably, um, you know, you could, you probably may have it set to uh, use monitor tracks. So if you have like a a, a MIDI part here, uh, and that track is set to be record enabled or to monitor, um, you could do that. But on the core track itself, you could basically, um, you know, when you come here, try to just turn off acoustic feedback. Uh, but it could be that those tracks are armed or that they're set to record, but try just turning off acoustic feedback here and that should stop it. Uh, 
Uh, so question why the multi outputs of a VSTI don't appear as tracks, but as buses only. So, you know, they are buses from the instrument. So the tracks themselves may not have, we can think of the tracks as having the data in them, but you know, when we send that data to an output bus, you know, to an output, that's when it's going to be kind of an output bus, if that makes sense. So that's why that's, there's that distinction with multi uh, outs. And if you're wondering why, you know, once you start activating, uh, we'll do this on a new project, why you don't see them is because they will probably get hidden into a folder. So I'll just do, uh, let's add an instrument track. And let's say with Groove Agent SE, I will come here. Um, so we do that. And now when I start to add outputs, so let's activate outputs. that we'll now see them, um, you know, so we'll just see that there. So they will often get placed directly into a particular folder, so. Okay, just reading through comments and we'll wrap up here in just a minute or two. Thanks for all the great questions. I hope someone, uh, everyone has learned something. So we're two likes away from a hundred. So let's see if we can, you know, if you haven't liked the video and you learned a new tip or trick or were inspired, please feel free to hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, make sure you do that as well. Okay, so uh, so when I record MIDI with the keyboard, data has come delayed in advance. I don't have the issue with other DAWs. So, you know, this could be, and I uh, sent you a link. Uh, this is from Dolly Smarty, or uh, the username says uh, maybe do Miniono from Cameroon. So I sent you a link on the, uh, the Hangout from last Friday. Uh, that might help, but if you have different plugins, try to make sure that you have the constraint delay compensation. Uh, try toggling that and see if that makes a difference for you as well. But I sent you a link with some other things that you could look up. Okay, uh, hi Greg, learned a bunch of cool tricks today. Example, parallel group craziness drum track. I opened a month old project and control room isn't responding. Should I engage in new user profiles? I don't think you need to do that, but you know, just check when you go to the studios that you know, uh, if you don't, you know, it could be that maybe the control room is just turned off. So make sure that it's turned on. Uh, and then that the routing is set. So sometimes if you turn on your interface and turn on your computer, the interface wasn't there, you may have to just kind of reset the routing. And I think you should be able to do that. Uh, so question, is it possible to trigger more than one command with a single key command? Uh, so you could have multiple key commands, multiple functions with the same key command, but realize that it may, you know, inadvertently do something in the background. You like, you may want to do function A when you're here and function B when you're in this editor, but realize that function A could still be triggered. Uh, and if you wanted to execute a series of commands, you could make what's called a macro. So once you go to your key commands here, and if you say, okay, I really want to do these five steps over and over again, at this point, we could choose to say, okay, I want to, you know, copy and lower volume. At this point, we could just, um, you know, execute a macro, which would just do a series of key commands for you. Okay. OK, 
Okay, so um So it's just see, let's see. Uh I'm so I'm probably running right about out of time. So I see there's more questions. Um so it's that I probably won't have a chance to go through, but I want to thank everyone for all the wonderful questions. Uh, if you've learned something new, uh, make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. We'll be doing another Hangout this Friday, uh, starting at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, so the same time as this one started. I want to wish everyone uh, good health and make sure that you stay safe and healthy. Um, and we will see everyone on Friday. If you want to send questions again in advance, send it to clubcubase at steinberg.de. Thank you so much, and look forward to seeing you guys on Friday, and let your friends know, and we'll be able to do more of these Hangouts in the future. Thank you so much. Goodbye.